Absolutely. Um, I believe there are two city commissioners who will be participating virtually. Um, I don't know if we need to check and make sure that they're available. Are they available? Is there any housekeeping? I'm here, okay. Uh, I hear you, Commissioner hey. Williams Cox. I'm I'm here as well. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Matlow. What was it? Hold on, Ari. Do you need a motion? Is there any particular legal housekeeping for them to participate by way of Zoom or uh, phone? If the city is adopting the county's board meeting procedure, then in fact it would require a vote of the other commissioners to allow them to participate virtually. Mr. Mayor, you'd like to get that motion? There's a, there, there's a motion <laughs> by, by the other two that are here, by the Mayor Pro Tem, if I seconded by Commissioner Porter to allow our colleagues to participate telephonically. Mr. See no further discussion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. It passes 3-0. The county Thank have you. to do the same thing? Would the county be required to do the same? If we have any uh, county commissioner attending virtually, yes, but I don't believe that to be the case. Okay. Well, it seems that the city is uh, communicating uh, uh, with telepathy, and I didn't know that was allowed. They just make motions. <laughs> All right. Artie. Thank you, Chairman, Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, it's my pleasure to bring the uh, proposed 2022 cycle comprehensive plan amendments uh, tonight for the transmittal hearing. Uh, just a quick recap. I know we did talk about this at the workshop, uh, but just a reminder that the comprehensive plan is the legal document that includes the goals, objectives, and policies that really set forth how we as a community grow and develop into the future. Uh, it really helps us coordinate uh, the growth demands based on kind of the, popul uh, the projected populations, uh, planned infrastructure to meet those demands, uh, environmental protection, as well as uh, things like economic development. So it's really kind of the blueprint for our community uh, moving forward over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, and just also kind of a quick recap of where we are in the overall development process. Uh, this is kind of the stage where we typically refer to it as uh, pre-development. So again, we're looking at uh, a legal document, goals, objectives, policies for this. Uh, so we're at the comprehensive plan stage. Some of these will have concurrent rezonings when we come back to the adoption hearing. Uh, we don't need to address those tonight per se, uh, but just kind of an acknowledgement that some of them will have uh, rezonings. Uh, this is really the stage where we look at the minimum and maximum intensities and densities allowed. And then with the implementing zoning, kind of a list of uses uh, it would be future steps, uh, the site plan uh, subdivision process, permitting where we really get into the details of uh, looking at natural in, uh, features inventory, stormwater management, flood protection. So tonight is really more of the, the goals, objectives, policies, and implementing zoning stage of things. Uh, so it, there's a ways away from this stage to actually seeing dirt turn uh, and development happen. Uh, kind of a, a quick recap again. Uh, this is an annual process we do, so every year we'll come forward with uh, proposed amendments. Uh, there will be some that are initiated by staff, so you'll see that those are more procedural in nature or things that we bring forward because of statutory requirements that may have changed. Uh, and then the rest would be publicly or privately initiated, so uh, individual citizens, property owners uh, can bring forward requested amendments to the comprehensive plan. Uh, and we do that as an annual cycle to make it easier for public notification. Uh, we can do public open houses on these amendments. Uh, we can bring the commissions together for discussion. Uh, and so uh, that was one of the things that we did at this last meeting. Uh, we had a workshop. Uh, the purpose of that was to uh, review the amendments and uh, request any additional information that you may have on them. Uh, we, following the workshop, did some additional analysis, pulled together some additional information. Uh, that is mostly summarized in attachment 13. A few things are in the staff reports as well, uh, but attachment 13 to this agenda item is where you'll see uh, the bulk of the requested information brought back. Uh, and we'll hit the highlights. Uh, it was attachment 13 to the agenda item for the overall uh, transmittal hearing. And we'll hit some of the highlights of that as well, uh, but if you don't hear us talk about it, uh, it should be in Attachment 13. Uh, when we review comprehensive plan amendments, uh, we re review them for consistency with the goals, objectives, and policies of the, the rest of the comprehensive plan. 
Uh, we do have 11 elements, and we kind of look across all 11 elements at the goals, objectives, and policies to ensure that we're being internally consistent uh, and not creating in any inconsistencies. That's really the scope of review that we have for comp plan amendments. Uh, and so kind of we note that when we uh, say that the recommendation would be to find it consistent with the comp plan. Uh, the same thing goes for rezonings. Our scope of review for rezonings is, again, consistency with the comprehensive plan. Uh, tonight is the transmittal hearing. Uh, this will be followed uh, in June by an adoption hearing. So uh, the goal tonight is not to adopt any amendments, but to decide whether to send these to the state landing, land planning agency, that's the State Department of Economic Opportunity, uh, other review agencies, so Florida Department of Transportation, <coughs> Environmental Protection, uh, and other state agencies. Also goes to the Northwest Florida Water Management District and the Regional Planning Council. They have an opportunity to review these amendments. Uh, if they have any objections or uh, recommendations or comments, they'll transmit those back to us. Uh, and then we can address those in the time between uh, we receive them and we bring them back in June. Uh, June 14th would be the hearing to actually adopt the amendments. So tonight is deciding whether to send them to the state. Uh, June 14th will be deciding whether to adopt them or not. We do have seven amendments. Uh, we'll be talking about six of them tonight. Uh, there is one small-scale amendment uh, that is located within the city limits. We'll note that at the very end, because it's a small-scale amendment, it does not go to the state for a review. It just gets adopted. Uh, and so there won't be any action on that tonight. Uh, so tonight we'll focus on the, the remaining six. Uh, with that, I'd like to invite uh, Melinda Mormon, the uh, administrator of conference of planning to go through this, uh, but we are both available for questions. Thanks, Artie. Um, we'll start with our first amendment. There we go. Um, the first amendment is uh, to add a property rights element to the comprehensive plan. This is required by uh, state legislator HB 59. Um, requires us to adopt a property rights element before we adopt any additional amendments to the comprehensive plan. Um, this is the suggested language. This is taken directly from the bill. Um, it, this simply reaffirms existing property rights. It doesn't add, it doesn't uh, retract, it just reaffirms property rights granted by federal and state law. Um, we highlighted the text that we changed and they're pretty simple changes. We changed the words his and her to their and we added the phrase subject to state law and local ordinances, which was already included in item two. We just felt it was appropriate to add them to all, the, all four items. So that one's pretty simple. I don't believe we have any speakers on this item. Um, so the recommendation is option one, conduct the transmittal public hearing and transmit the proposed amendment to the state land planning agency. And I'll pause for questions and your vote. Um, Mr. Mayor, we defer to the city as our house guest and we make sure you all weigh in first. All right, it's been properly moved by the mayor pro tem. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Properly second by Commissioner Porter. Any, any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Passes uh, unanimously on the city side five. Very good, Commissioner Dozier. Um, sorry, Mr. Chair, I was just going to make a motion. Okay. Second. We have a motion to second from the county. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. It passes aye. unanimously. Thank you. Next. Okay. Item. Thank you. Moving on. Uh, this is another joint text amendment, so both city and county would vote <clears> on it. <throat> this is an update to the future right of way needs map. Um, Future right-of-way needs map identifies roadway corridors where public right-of-way is needed to implement identified transportation projects. So the update would remove completed projects or projects that have the necessary right-of-way. Um, the staff report is included in this on, on, as attachment two. And the recommendation for this is option two, to conduct the transmittal public hearing and transmit the proposed amendment to the State Land Planning Agency. I don't believe we have any speakers on this item either, so. All right. Thank you. I'll pause for, for discussion and vote. Um, I'll move for the option number two staff recommendation. All right. Commissioner Porter's properly moved recommendation option number two. Second. Seconded by the Mayor Pro Tem. 
Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, aye. All those opposed, passes unanimously 5 0. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, County Commissioners, what is your pleasure? Second. Motion second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. Moving on. Uh, this is the last joint text amendment that we're going over today, for, so the city and the county would vote on this one. This is the proposed expansion of the urban services area to include parcels related to our three large-scale map amendments. That's April Road, Woodville Highway, and Southwood Plantation Road. This results in a total of about 305 acres of additional area added to the USA. And here's a map that we put together that kind of shows all the properties at one time and, and their relation to the current USA. Um, Woodville Highway is the furthest south. Um, it results in a total of 62.01 acres of additional area. April Road results in an additional 134.9 acres of additional area. And Southwood Plantation Road results in an additional 107.79 acres of additional area added into the USA. There's quite a bit of discussion on this at the March 22nd workshop. So we, in attachment 13, we've addressed those items. Um, and I'm also going to ask Artie to cover some of the highlights of that um, with the next few slides. Mr. Chairman, as Artie approaches, may I ask a question real quick? Just procedure. Chair recognizes Commissioner Dozier. Thank you. This is more for our procedure. Um, this amendment as we all know, obviously re relates to um, our next three. And it would be my preference, I'm wondering if we could have discussion about the other amendments and the USA amendment before taking a vote, just to get, because the questions overlap between the USA expansion and the other comp plan amendments. So would you, are you suggesting that we take this out of sequence and go through the next three? <clears throat> That, that would be my suggestion. I mean, we had a couple of questions on Woodville Highway last time, but a good amount of questions. Um, and I think some of them, thankfully, you know, were addressed by staff in the item. I just wouldn't want to move forward with this particular USA expansion until we have that discussion and have some of those questions answered. And I think that's appropriate in case there's any public speakers. Once this is done, it, you know, it, it, it's a huge move in that direction. So I'm not, I'm not speaking against it. I'm just saying that I, I would like to have that discussion and the conversation about those other items in con conjunction with this one. So, Mr. Mayor, does the city have any objections to uh, the request of which that uh, the chair supports that we're able to integratively discuss this item aligned with uh, the three subsequent items your, Maybe. Cha your chambers. Let's okay. go forward. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, house rules suggest that um, the mayor says it's our chamber. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> Didn't know that. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, what we want to be able to do, staff, is to what, what Commissioner Doja is asking is that we integratively uh, overlay this item with each of the next three and that maybe we're holding off a vote so we're. Um, we use word commingling, but we're needing to uh, apply um, standards or thoughts from this item with the others, and we don't want to make a definitive move. Is there any objection, uh, County Attorney? The will of the board. Very good. All right, we'll proceed in that manner. So, commissioners, our desire, city commissioners, is to um, to not vote and give away the plantation before we understand what's coming with these other items. So, um, you know, at a house closing, you want to know everything before you sign the dotted line. Okay, you good? Uh, okay. Thank you, Chairman, Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, at the workshop, there was a bit of a discussion on uh, the urban service area, population projections, uh, vacant land. So uh, I'll kind of walk through the analysis that we conducted for that. Uh, we'll note that uh, the census in 1990 uh, which was actually the year the comprehensive plan was adopted, uh, to the 2020 census that just happened, uh, saw a, an increase in the population of Leon County of 99,705 people, which puts the population as of the 2020 census at 292,198 <coughs> 292, people in all of Leon County. That includes the city of Tallahassee. 
Uh, as you saw in your agenda materials for the joint affordable housing workshop uh, that was on uh, July 13th of last year, uh, there was a note in that about the current status of uh, housing availability uh, in Leon County, Tallahassee, uh, kind of compared to other locations. Uh, those agenda materials noted that uh, in May of 2021, which was when the uh, information was pulled together, that there was a 3.1 month supply of existing and new houses available. Uh, that translates to about 200, uh, 2,222 homes. Uh, the, the nation at that time had a housing supply of 5.1 months. Uh, both the nation and uh, Tallahassee uh, were behind what the Board of Realtors recommended, which is a six-month supply. So we're looking at essentially a deficit of three months supply of housing uh, at that time. Looking forward, uh, we look at the population projections from the Bureau of Economic and Business Research, Bieber. We call it Bieber. Uh, you can say you have Bieber fever if you'd like, but uh, I know I do. Uh, and the agenda materials, I will note that uh, this information on the slide is a little bit newer. Uh, there was a request at the workshop that if the new Bieber projections came out uh, before this meeting, that we use those. So uh, those new projections are on the slide. Uh, basically, by 2045, the estimated population of Leon County will be 332,800. Uh, and with the updated projections, they actually added the next five-year increment, which would be 2050. Uh, so we now have estimates for 2050. We're looking at a population of 337,600 uh, in Leon County. Uh, and those are the ones that are reflective of the, the, the last census. This translates to an, uh, an expected need for between 21,876 units to 24,462 uh, housing units by 2050. And when we look at the comp plan in terms of, you know, do we have land available to accommodate this projected growth, uh, we did some analysis, and I'll kind of walk through that uh, now. Um, I know there's a lot kind of going on on this. This is also included in the agenda materials. Uh, but I'll walk through each one of these uh, as quickly as I can, but uh, with enough detail that hopefully it's uh, insightful. So the, the first row on this chart is, uh, and I'll just go back, this entire table is a summary of the vacant and potentially developable lands in all of Leon County. So if we look at row number one, this is vacant. Uh, land that's in residential single-family detached subdivisions. These are subdivisions that are generally characterized by just one home on a parcel. So not townhouses, not duplexes. It might include a few in the subdivision, but generally we're looking at single-family detached homes. Uh, there are 1,895 parcels that meet that criteria, and the median parcel size is just over a quarter acre. Uh, this median parcel size is important because we have subdivision regulations that talk about single-family detached home zoning. So uh, residential preservation one, residential preservation two, R1, R2, these are all zoning districts that are intended for single-family detached homes. Uh, and the subdivision regulations say that you cannot subdivide where you would create a situation where you end up with parcels that are more than 10% smaller than the median parcel size. What this really means, and I know that's a lot, what it really means is we're not going to see these parcels subdivide anymore. They're pretty much subdivided as much as they can. And so with that, if all of these parcels came onto the market and got developed as residential, we would see about 1,895 units total uh, in this category. The second row is vacant parcels and commercial subdivisions. For the purposes of population accommodation, we can completely ignore this road because this is commercial development. So this is not residential development. Uh, you're not going to build homes in a business park or an industrial park. So we can kind of ignore this row for now. Uh, when we look at row number three, these are vacant parcels and subdivisions that are kind of classified as unknown or mixed type. What that means is there's a mixture of uses. You might see everything from churches and stores and daycares and uh, residential development. Uh, it's not homogeneous in terms of the development that you see in those subdivisions. Uh, in all of Leon County, kind of in this category, you see 1,759 parcels. 
And I know that I'm talking a little bit different from how we've often talked about uh, population accommodation. In the past, we've talked about the number of acres in a certain land use category. Uh, but the, the reality is we can't just pretend like it's all aggregated and then you can subdivide it. Uh, there are existing parcels that have been established. And so it's really helpful, I think, to kind of understand how the arrangement of these parcels is. So if we look at this category, uh, these are in subdivisions. They've already been subdivided. Again, the median parcel size is less than a quarter acre in this case, 0.2. So you're really not going to see these subdivide anymore. So if we make the assumption that all of these parcels become available on the market and get developed as residential development, we'll have 1,759 dwelling units built. Uh, that's what you would see in this, this category. Uh, I'll skip number four and I'll come back to that because this is where we'll get to a little bit more information. But if we look at rows number five, number nine, and number 10, uh, these are vacant lots in existing mobile home subdivisions, condo <coughs> subdivisions, and townhouse subdivisions. Uh, they're very much like the, the first two that I talked about where uh, they're already parceled out. You can see the median size for the condo subdivision is 0 0.02 uh, acres in size. Again, these are not going to be subdivided any further. They're in existing sub, uh, subdivisions. They're already parceled out to a size that you wouldn't be able to, to subdivide them anymore. If all of these parcels in each of these three categories combined came on the market and were developed for residential, we would see 810 dwelling units built. Uh, and again, there's a, a difference between land being vacant and land being available. So vacant means there's nothing on it. Available means someone can buy it and actually build on it. So it really kind of depends on the property owner being willing to sell and have their property developed. If you look at row number one, number three, number five, nine, and 10, and aggregate them together, what that essentially means is a maximum of uh, 4,464 units could be built in these categories. So when we're looking at infill development, looking at parcels available in existing subdivisions, uh, really our growth potential caps out at 4,464 dwelling units. Uh, when we look at rows six and seven, uh, these are a little different. Um, these are actually not vacant properties. We flag these because these are properties that are over 10 <coughs> acres in size inside the urban service area. So they have a huge potential for future development. But again, they're not actually vacant at the time. There's existing residential uses on them. So we note them and we kind of track them because it's important to understand where we might <coughs> see development in the future, uh, but also kind of understanding that you know, these, are, these are not vacant. Someone lives there. Uh, when we move on to row number eight, uh, these are vacant parcels in subdivisions with lots that are bigger than other lots in the subdivision. Uh, I mentioned this because I noted the subdivision regulations that say you can't subdivide in a way that creates smaller than the median size lot. Um, these actually have the potential for subdivision. Uh, so these are areas where we might actually see some subdivision occur, some, some more development happen. Uh, I will note that of these 79 parcels, or of these 49 parcels, because there's 49 throughout Leon County that meet this criteria, uh, 39 offer some potential for development if they come onto the market. Uh, 10 are already accounted for in major, uh, major developments, which will be kind of the next category I talk about. Uh, so we might see some uh, on 39 of those parcels. Going back to row number four, uh, this is vacant property, not in a subdivision. Uh, also, I will note for number eight, vacant larger than lo other lots in subdivisions. Also kind of understanding that there might be some opposition to uh, from the public on developing more intensely land that is already in the subdivision. Uh, oftentimes we kind of run into that when we're developing next to people who already live there. So. I can't ignore that fact because that does, you know, result in people coming to this commission and speaking for three minutes about uh, their concerns, especially if it's adjacent to existing development, which uh, is what number eight is. 
So jumping to, to number four, uh, this represents really the most potential for development to happen in our community. Uh, these are vacant parcels that are not in a subdivision. Uh, they tend to be a little bit larger. Um, the, the, the median is just over an acre in size. Uh, there are a number of them that are actually larger in size. Uh, and this is really the category where we see planned development, like our major developments. Uh, of this category, 16% is in the urban residential land use category. So 16% of these parcels would be residential development for sure. Uh, I mean, they could do a comp plan amendment, but as of now, without a comp plan amendment, uh, these would be where we would see residential development, uh, that 16%. 12% is in the suburban land use category, so that may be residential, that may be non-residential, that may be a mix of uses. It's kind of hard to guesstimate what that's going to be at this point uh, because suburban allows uh, residential, non-residential, office, retail, a lot of different kinds of uses. But the, the rest, the, the, the bulk of it is in plan development, major developments, uh, and that's kind of where we'll see the bulk of development happening in this community over the next couple of months, years, decades. It is also important to note that while this is where we'll see a lot of the development happen, the development in these areas tends to be a lot more complex than the development you would see on the other properties. So if it's an existing lot and you want to build it, you already have the land use, you already have the zoning, you kind of move forward with permitting and construction. Uh, these major developments have a lot more involved with them. A uh, couple of examples. So the Wolani Arch, uh, that was a master plan that was approved in 2020. Uh, it is probably the largest, I'm pretty sure it is the largest of these properties at 4,600 acres. So that is a huge area. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, this is getting a little abstract and something happens in my head. I, my mind drifts when things get very abstract, and I'm drifting. What does the English property fit in, for instance, and how do you decorate it with all of the boxes that you could check off there? Uh, this actually does, in, this box includes the English property, and I'll, uh, I'll get to that one very, uh, very soon, I promise. So for the Wolani Arch at 4,600 units, we did a critical area plan, master plan for the property, uh, at your direction, we did significant amounts of public engagement. Through that, we've identified in the master plan that 40% of that 4,600 acres has to be set aside in open space. Uh, we also have comp plan provisions that cap the development in terms of residential development of the Wolani Arch at 12,500 units. So the absolute max you'll see in the Wolani Arch for residential development is 12,500 units. So will that accommodate a significant amount of the growth in the future? Yes. Will it accommodate all of it? It won't. Uh, it will accommodate a maximum of 12,500 units. But before that can happen, there is a phasing plan that was included in the master plan that has thresholds that have to be met before you can move to the next phase. So it may, over the life of the Wolani Arch, include 12,500 units, it does not allow 12,500 units immediately. Uh, I will also note that before any development can happen in the Bologna Arch, uh, planned unit developments must be completed. So you have to do the PUD, go through the PUD process. Uh, and before you can begin and have a PUD approved, the entire arch requires a stormwater facilities master plan. So yes, there's growth potential here, and this is where we would see a lot of the development over the next couple of decades happen, there's also a lot of stuff. How does that compare to the potential development of the south side and the regional uh, uh, flushing out of bringing uh, new developer properties online? And I've um, heard, <clears throat> in particular with city commissioners, uh, their expressions for, quote, balanced growth. And um, with the uh, lion's share, uh, using your example, uh, going to the Northeast, uh, how does the a comparable build out and bringing online of properties occur uh, in the west side uh, to the south side? And how do we make sure that we're proportioning that growth uh, appropriately? So we, we looked at the 
available property on the south side to be developed, and it's significantly less than we initially actually thought. Um, in order to have more development on the south side, it would require the urban services area to be expanded on the south side, uh, quite frankly. Um, a couple of other examples, the Ulani Hill, that's 811 acres. Let me ask acres. you another question. I feel like you're trying to blow me off, man. Um, is there a, a uh, metric that you use for a direction of growth that is proportioned? And you just told me that, well, we've under guesstimated the, um, what are we doing? And do we have a policy? with the needs that have gone projected to 2045, will the other parts of our community be in play for this housing? Or is it simply the response that you're asking us to support? Let's just go to the Northeast, Northeast, Northeast. That's what I'm trying to get you to answer. Commissioner, and as part of this, I'm not trying to encourage expansions on the Northeast. Uh, I'm painting a picture of where development can happen today so that uh, the commissioners at this table can make decisions about where, ha where growth should happen tomorrow. Uh, there are three amendments to the urban services area uh, that are part of the cycle. Uh, one is on the south side, and two of them are on the west, southwest portion of the, or east, southeast portion of the community. Uh, as far as other, other things that we're doing, we're currently engaging in the uh, Southside Action Plan, which part of that is doing a lot of the data analysis, looking at what has happened since those policies were originally put into the comp plan, and what should those policies have us do moving forward. So definitely looking at you know, how, do we, how do we get development on the south side the way that we've intended through policy. Have the policies been working, or do we need to revise those policies to move us closer to actually having more development on the south side, commensurate with other parts of the community? Uh, because we have seen the trend that you know, development tends to move towards the northeast, and we do want it to be more equitable across the community. I do, too. All right. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Already uh, in that same vein, are you looking also at infill development? You know, we talked about uh, uh, housing opportunities on the fairgrounds property, and there may be some others, but are you looking at infill development opportunities also on the south side of town? And could we augment, Commissioner Richardson, with your question, since it's uh, right contiguous to English property, yes. that also integrate? In your yeah, response. Yeah. I mean, that's what I had in mind was okay. that English yeah, yeah. property as well. <clears throat> right, right. Um, so as part of the, the South Side Action Plan, we are looking at the potential for development, redevelopment in that area uh, and what policies would support that. Uh, for this, we are looking at land that we know is vacant uh, or that has a very, very high likelihood of being redeveloped. Uh, it's always possible that someone sells a business or a business closes and then that ha redevelopment of the site happens organically. That's harder for us to predict or know. Um, but kind of what we're looking at here is what property is available or is vacant, could potentially become available, and what does that mean for our ability to accommodate the, the projected population growth. Uh, so the, the Colin English property, uh, that southeast sector plan area, uh, last month, there was a PUD expansion approved. Uh, it added 494 acres to the existing English PUD. Uh, it allows, that PUD as a whole, allows 9,880 units to be built. Uh, we'll kind of note with a caveat that uh, as residential development and other development occurs in that PUD, the, the, whoever ends up developing that site will be responsible for uh, the extension of Paul Russell Road, uh, building at least two of the lanes, and then dedicating the right-of-way. So, again, that's one of those where we see the potential, but we also know that there are a couple of steps that have to happen and things that have to happen along with it. So 
it's not that someone can go out there today and build that many units. Okay. That's what we also see uh, with the Walani Hill. Again, it would require uh, plan unit development. It would require a stormwater facilities master plan for the entire site. So these are all areas where there's potential for development, but there are a number of steps that have to be taken before any dirt can be turned. Mm -hmm. Are, you, are we also looking at the area around the airport? Is all of it, is that included in in your what you're discussing? It is now as well. Sure. Yes. Okay. So overall, um, here's kind of a map of the properties uh, that are vacant and potentially developable. Uh, we do have a number of incentives that are included in attachment 13 for how we try to encourage and incentivize infill development. Uh, but I must also note that as we encourage and incentivize infill development, we also have some challenges. One is that lot availability. Just because it's vacant doesn't mean that it's available. Right. Uh, we have the subdivision regulations that I noted that make it harder to subdivide property. Part of the reason we don't usually see the maximum allowed happen is because of the subdivision regulations that say you can only subdivide so much. Uh, as well as zoning regulations that talk about the lot size, the setbacks, things like that. Uh, by the time you account for roadways, infrastructure, stormwater facilities, natural features, open space, uh, the subdivision regulations, lot size regulations, and anything else in the line development code, uh, we don't typically see those maximums. So uh, tonight I was talking about what we would see maximum development, uh, but we also know realistically that we probably won't see that uh, a couple of ways that we've addressed this population growth over time, as I noted, we grew by nine, over 99,000 people since 1990, since the adoption of the comp plan, uh, is looking at the urban service area. Uh, since the adoption of the comp plan, there have been 12 modifications to the urban services area. Uh, it has resulted in the USA increasing by about 2.4% of the, the urban service area while our population has increased 51.8% uh, in terms of what we've seen in terms of population growth. Uh, and again tonight, uh, the, the three amendments to the, the urban services area are shown on this map. Uh, we'll note that there's the, the one on the south side, uh, Woodville Highway and Capitol Circle area, and then the two on the east side. Excuse me, Ms. Ari, um, Commissioner Minor has a question before you go much further. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Um, Artie, just to take a step back real quick, I mean, the, the spreadsheet you have on the vacant codes I thought was very helpful, and that's very much in line with what we were asking for at the last uh, joint workshop. Thank you very much. My question is related to this, but you, you, you do a really good job of, estim of basically providing the number of vacant parcels. My question is related to what Commissioner Richardson asked, which is, as we get additional pressure to provide more units uh, as our population grows from now to 2050, um, there will also be that pressure, not just on these vacant lots, but also on the existing lots that have structures already on them. Um, how much redevelopment might occur and, and actually dividing of the parcels to maximize the existing parcels that have units on them right now? Are we talking about an order of magnitude that's, that's negligible, or might we get a few thousand extra actually units available by, by squeezing some of those existing parcels that might be renovated in the coming years to produce more? My guess is that you know it, it's you're not gonna, in the next between now and 2050 you're not going to see a massive change in the amount of existing structures. But I, I need to ask a planner to make sure to get a sense because you've given us a good number on the, on the vacant parcels. But how much should we add on to that redevelopment opportunities that might provide more units? There's definitely an opportunity for redevelopment across the community. Uh, I think much of that redevelopment has happened. Mm. Uh, you know. One of the, the more transformative things that has happened to this community is the Gain Street Corridor. Uh, that was a lot of vacant properties that have, over time, been redeveloped. I don't see large areas like that where we have an entire corridor of vacant warehouses. Uh, so I think you'll start seeing things happen, but more gradually. Uh, so an example would be uh, a couple of years ago, there were comp plan amendments that looked at um, the, the Chapel Drive area on West Tennessee Street 
and it was taking uh, what was a residential preservation neighborhood that really no longer met the definition of residential preservation uh, and took it to university transition, that comp plan amendment then allowed that redevelopment to happen. So uh, I think there's going to be a lot of examples where we may be coming forward with comp plan amendments if property owners decide that they are ready to uh, change what their property looks like. Someone can aggregate those parcels uh, and they've turned that to student housing. So you kind of see what was uh, a neighborhood of single family homes that became student rentals now become multifamily development. But, but as you suggested, it kind of makes sense. I mean, that, that will not, that's very unlikely to happen on type of grand scale. I mean, you might have a couple of cases like that between now and 2050. But in, it, it's not a magnitude that is going to be something that's going to affect our analysis right here in terms of just more units available in addition to the list of vacant um, lots or parcels you've got here. I would love to see redevelopment, broader scheme, reusing existing buildings, kind of seeing buildings that are uh, not historically significant but older and kind of need of repair be redeveloped and reused in other ways. I don't really have a way of predicting it. Yeah, yeah. So I guess to summarize real quick, so it would probably stand a reason that if we're looking at 24,000 new units that are going to be needed between now and 2050, most of those will probably come from these vacant parcels that you have in the spreadsheet. The, 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 the majority probably will, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Very good. Any other questions from commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Porter. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I mean, I think in response to you, Commissioner Minor, a little bit, you know, I mean, I think whether or not that happens and to what extent is up to us. And, and what kinds of policies we make that, you know, incentivize or encourage that. And not that that on its own could totally change the outcome to be sufficient in and of itself. But, but I do think that is part of what we do here is, you know, decide where we want to go and, and do our best to get there. I was wondering, Artie, if you could, you mentioned a little bit about there not being as much to develop in the south side as we expected and that we need to expand and that we need to expand the USA in the south side for those reasons for that reason I was wondering if you could just ex elaborate on that right commissioner um, so a lot of the properties on the south side are developed um, you know, we look at the different neighborhoods bond community Providence some of those and for the most part, those neighborhoods are built out. There are a couple of vacant lots uh, that would have been that category, uh, I think, row number one or row number three in terms of uh, vacant parcels in existing neighborhoods. Um, this is also an area where, uh, if I'm making a staff recommendation, I would tread carefully with too much redevelopment because we don't want to fuel gentrification in these areas. Mm -hmm. So we want to be very cognizant and very deliberate in terms of how development happens in these areas. Uh, but in terms of having vacant land that is ready for residential development, uh, it's not significant quantities. Um, with the exception of the, the PUD that was recently approved for the Colin English property. Um, and you know the the, the comp plan specifically says that is intended to have uh, residential development uh, encouraged on the south side. So uh, by the approval of that PUD, we've kind of opened up more land than there was. Uh, but with the exception of that, uh, I think we're kind of you know a few parcels here and there. Um, they're already parceled out. So uh, when you add up the aggregate of the acreage, it seems like there's more. But once you actually look at how the parcels are arranged. Uh, it's actually much harder to fit uh, significant amounts of development. Uh, clearly nothing as large as, say, like the Wolani Arch or the Wolani Hill, like these large parcels. They are small parcels scattered throughout that are available. Thank you. You know, I mean, I think that I definitely agree with the the problem here or the demand and the, and the need. There maybe disagreement about, you know, then what do we do? I'm wondering if you could talk us through what alternatives, if any, there are to expanding the urban services area to such an extent. You know, at a certain point, 
Is there anything that you think can be done other than expanding the urban services area or other than expanding it this much that meets this need? Yes, and I apologize for my light hesitation. Uh, I've actually received death threats in this career, um, and it's usually when I talk about uh, increasing development capacity in existing neighborhoods. That is an option. We can look at exclusionary zoning, zoning that only allows single family detached homes. Uh, but I don't really want to be the one to bring it up because people don't like it when you talk about doing anything with existing neighborhoods. And I'm kind of afraid to say that, to be honest. So when it comes to the comp plan and making policy decisions, and you know, thankfully I on this side, and I appreciate the work that y'all do on that side, uh, there are a lot of trade-offs that have to be made. You know, do we build up or do we build out? Mm -hmm. You ultimately have to build somewhere because if you don't build somewhere, you build expensive because just the law of supply and demand. If you would build out, we risk promoting urban sprawl, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, Hopefully, if we do build out, we can do things like we did with Wolani and set aside 40% as open space. If we build up, we're talking about adjacent to people's homes. Uh, you know, I hesitate to bring it up, but there was a glitch bill that came in front of the city commission, and there were people who came and spoke because they didn't want the flexibility to go up one story, one story higher to save the trees but they want to save the trees. Mm. So I very much appreciate the hard decisions that y'all have to make uh, in terms of where these trade-offs are made. You know, do we prioritize protecting trees? Do we prioritize infill development? Do we say, hey, we want to protect existing neighborhoods, so we're going to grow out? Do we want to grow out? You know, as, as my job as staff, I can make recommendations, I can run analysis, I can give you this information, uh, but ultimately, I appreciate the hard decisions that y'all have to make. Uh, and I also don't want any more death threats. Okay, Ari, um, Commissioner uh, Porter, if Ari missed it, would you restate your question, please? Well, and, and I, you definitely touched on it, of course. And, you know, I, I, I'm sorry that you had to go through that. I'm sure, you know, we've gotten those kinds of emails, too. It's not, I mean, it should go without saying that's totally inappropriate and criminal <laughs> and you know so you know that's we should be able to have a conversation about alternatives without it getting to that point um, and I I agree that in any decision we make there's going to be give and take and and growing pains and that um, I think it's part of human nature to want competing things um, you did touch on one, and if that's the main one or the only one, then that's, I hear you. I mean, as which it was based, I mean, you talked about building up, you talked about, I mean, because when I look at this list and, and reading more of the content, which by the way, I mean, I really, really appreciate the additional information, super, super helpful, not only for making this decision, but informing what other steps we might need to take to, um, maybe remove some of the challenges to infill um, that exist. But I'm wondering, you know, outside of it being something that is politically unpopular in some neighborhoods or angering to people, you know, what practically have we considered in the past? Or, you know, I, again, I'm not trying to make you totally repeat yourself, but building up, you know, whether it's pushing ADUs, whether it's, you know, what else have we considered? Yeah, so uh, there was the uh, approval of the ADU ordinance, as you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, I believe, I know anywhere within the city limits, I'd have to check with uh, DSM in terms of how the county works. Uh, but, you know, there was a significant relaxation in terms of the ADU policy, uh, and you can do ADUs. And uh, I think that was a, you know, 
from a planning perspective, a huge win in terms of promoting uh, some affordable options that are not uh, traditional uh, affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, I think the way those work uh, is pretty significant in terms of allowing people to take property and use it to, to help them stay in their homes because they can rent out a property uh, or uh, as they age in place, give them the ability to move into the ADU. Actually, one of my neighbors has moved into an ADU in her backyard and rents out the main house. So I think that's been uh, a huge win in terms of uh, this community. Uh, there have been a lot of incentives that promote redevelopment, uh, again, included in uh, attachment 13, uh, especially with you know allowing redevelopment to account for the existing impervious surface and things like that. Uh, it allows you to develop, redevelop those sites more so than you could if it were greenfield development and nothing existed. So uh, a lot of work has been done. Um, the, uh, uh, there was some of the provisions in the glitch bill that allowed a little bit more flexibility to, to, to rearrange a site. Uh, we do have the multimodal transportation district uh, that really helps look at how do we increase density in a very defined area and move towards more sustainable options for transportation. Uh, I think really in terms of what else could be done moving forward, uh, it's the, you know, being a little bit more relaxed in terms of housing types and density allowed in existing neighborhoods. Uh, that's really where the, the next step would be. Uh, you know, if you start allowing duplexes, triplexes, quads, maybe even uh, what we call multiplexes, like a six unit kind of thing mm -hmm. uh, in existing neighborhoods, uh, you see that in a lot of the, the neighborhoods already. Uh, people may not necessarily want to admit it, but you know, if you were in Lafayette Park and you were on uh, Meridian Street, you know, right there's a single family home, across the street's a quad. The world has not ended, <laughs> you know, it works. Uh, but I will say that any time that we've done public engagement and these topics have come up, uh, the, the reaction has been swift and harsh. Mm -hmm. And I, from a planning perspective, think that these are really good things, encouraging missing middle, uh, looking at options. I know that the, the city commission has looked at options at taking uh, existing hotels and converting those, mm -hmm. looking at student uh, apartments that have been further out as students move closer in, kind of converting those to more family. Um, but again, if you want to have a, not just a piece here and a piece here, it's gonna be looking at existing neighborhoods and what can you do in existing neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate, I mean, I think this is, uh, not that we've never had this discussion before, but a really important discussion to have. You know, I mean, there's a reason you went to get a master's. There's a reason I did. You know, expertise matters. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in having these conversations and balancing that as well with the expertise that people have about what they want. You know, people are usually experts in, in what they want. Um, so, you know, these are not, these are not easy, easy discussions for sure. And I think some of these preferences, my impression can be generational as well. Um, and can be affected also by your socioeconomic status and literally what you can afford or, or not afford. And I know the pressures for homeowners on their property values is, you know, incredibly important and not a negligible fact. Um, I had a, a couple more questions. Could you talk us through, and this is for my benefit and the, the public, I mean, what happens once you expand the USA? I mean, at what point, I mean, I assume the city does not immediately just start building all kinds of things, or, or does it? I mean, what, what are kind of the next steps? So there's a, a couple of potential next steps. So uh, each of these proposed amendments are, uh, small enough that they don't trip a threshold that would require a plan development. So uh, if we were to bring in 
Uh, in fact, I think there was a 2004 report um, that was done by a number of uh, citizens in the community. Uh, I know the late Pam Hall was part of it, and there was Penny Herman and a, num a number of other ones that said that we should uh, look at this entire area here uh, as kind of a next area for urban service area expansion, uh, kind of as Southwood grew out. That would be large enough that that would require the same steps that we went through with something like Walani and uh, some of the other ones. So uh, the owner or an applicant or someone who you know, has authority over the property would have to go through the process of developing a master plan. That master plan would then get reflected in the comp plan. Uh, then they would do plan unit developments. And if there were other stipulations like a stormwater facilities master plan for the entire area, that would have to happen. And so there would be a number of steps that then led up to them submitting site plans and uh, plan unit um, uh, subdivisions and going for permitting and then construction. Uh, for something a little bit smaller, um, the, the three that are uh, proposed amendments for this cycle, uh, they don't trip the threshold for requiring a, a, a master plan. So uh, they would then need uh, the MAP amendment, which is one of the, the proposed amendments, uh, concurrent rezoning. And then from there, uh, they would be able to develop site plans that they would work through, uh, unless it was annexed into the city, it would work through the county's growth management departments um, or department uh, development support and environmental management. Uh, they would come in with uh, a site plan. They would come in with their um, natural features inventory. Uh, the staff would review it to make sure that you know any of those environmental cultural resources that are on the site are not being disturbed or messed up. Uh, they would apply for permitting and then kind of move forward with construction. So uh, for the ones that are a little bit smaller, it's a little bit quicker. I won't say it's a quick, but it's a little bit quicker of a process because it doesn't have those additional steps that we see with uh, like Wolani and the Southeast Sector Plan and some of those other areas just because they're a little bit smaller. Okay, thank you. And, and I'm going to wrap up soon. Um, what assessment, if any, has been done of sort of the the city's projected fiscal capacity to to manage the increase in services? So uh, most of the services are provided uh, if it's if it's city utilities. Uh, at this location, I can't remember if it's city or talk one. I know they have access to uh, infrastructure um, because there's developments all around these. Uh, but if it's the city utilities, the utilities you know, most of it's paid for through those user fees. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the city does regular rate studies to ensure that they're charging enough for uh, the generation, the consumption, and the kind of the maintenance of that infrastructure. Uh, so it's really, it really driven by user fees. Okay. Um, you got some more questions? Yeah, just one more um, to kind of bring it home for me. I mean, what can... It's not as if development can't happen if we don't expand the urban services area, correct? Right. It's not a, a right. on development. Right. It wouldn't so, happen there, or if it did, it would be on septic and well water and not on... on right, on right. So that's really what we're talking about. Right. The, the question of the urban services area is, do these areas get urban services? Right, right. Or no, I just... I, yeah, and I just want to make that clear kind of for the public, because that's something that, you know, can get muddied a little bit. Okay, thank you. That's it for me. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Maddox. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, I, I caught that moment a second ago. I want to thank you for your courage to make a recommendation that professionally you know are right. Um, despite whatever uh, threats of harm may come your way, I appreciate that. Um, I think for us, though, this is a serious conversation of we don't like extending boundaries. We don't like looking at extending the USA. We don't. I mean, we talked about urban fringe eventually becoming something uh, that in the future would, would possibly be where places where we move the urban services line 20 and 30 years from now. But on the flip side of that, there's opposition to what real infill looks like. Mm -hmm. The two don't match. At some point, we're either going to have to look at these different housing types that other places are already looking at, other places are already going to. I mean, New York and LA, they've been did it. I think Orlando is starting to do stuff like that. Tampa is starting to do stuff like that. 
And though there may be opposition, I don't want to throw the load on, on, on staff to make that recommendation back and take the pressure when, in all actuality, all they can do is make recommendations and we are the policy makers. They should be presenting us with, with options and, and those of those options, we should make the decision. So I appreciate the fact that you had the courage to make the recommendation but in, in the future. I just want options. And secondly, um, we say I, there's a lot of opposition from citizens groups, but I think what we have to stress to those citizens groups and those committees that we put together is something has to happen, either one or the other. Either there's going to be infill or we're going to extend boundaries. Which do you want? We love our trees. We love our canopy roads. We love the aesthetic look of Tallahassee. It cannot stay that way if we don't do one or the other. I think we all agree on that. So, so maybe that's the way we start the conversation. There is no way that we don't grow. Mm -hmm. This city, this county has to grow. People are going to come here, 99,000 people in the span of how long, Artie, you said? Uh, it was since 1990. Since 1990, so let's say, let's say 20 years from now, we're probably looking at about the same growth, if, if not more, which would put us over what, maybe closer to 400,000 or so, I'm thinking. And what we have now can't accommodate that, but you would have, I mean, if we could accommodate that in any way, I would imagine that given who we are as a city and county, we would rather do as much of it as we can with infill versus growing out. Now, the other piece that I had talked to Artie about, frankly, um, uh, earlier this week when I had a meeting with the constituent was looking at as we move forward and looking at the comp plan, aesthetically, those those urban fringe areas, one of the things I think we should consider is is not carbon copying what ur what every one of those urban fringe areas should look like. I believe that each one of them have their own character. Woodville is different than Bannerman. Bannerman is different than Fort Braden. Fort Braden is different than Chairs. Um, and I think those people out there should decide kind of what they would like their urban friends to look like. Understanding that eventually we don't want it to be urban friends. Eventually it would be in the USA, which, but that, again, that's way down the line. Ultimately, all I want to say is I appreciate your courage, but we have, we as policymakers have to stress to our constituents that growth is going to happen regardless of they want it or not. It's going to happen. And they, and they are going to have to make some hard decisions about how we go about it. And we're willing to listen to them. But this idea of, you know, death threats, it can't happen here, there's no option but my option, that's, that's just not going to work. It's just not going to work. Because then it comes to urban sprawl, and nobody wants that. And I hope that as a board, as two different boards, or but as, as a joint group, we can all support that thought process that we got to do something. Okay. We absolutely have to do something. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, to Artie's point, uh, is it legal that you can threaten a public official uh, with death uh, related to their job? Does he have any legal protection? Let's, let's just go there because uh, his comments to me uh, sounds like that was an illegal uh, comment conveyed to him. What, what protects him in his job? I am not an expert in criminal law, so I cannot give you a specific answer on that. If a member of the staff is receiving death threats, it's my hope and expectation they would report that and it would be investigated to determine whether it, in fact, is a criminal matter. Very good. Ari, I would commend to you to follow that advice. Commissioner Dozier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to echo my colleagues' comments. This last item in our agenda is robust, it's informative, and just to pick up on a couple of things you said um, before the discussion, we, we have talked in acreage, available acreage for a long time. Seeing those maps and really drilling down, and thankfully I can expand it on the iPad because it's, it's, it's really little, um, it, and the parcels and looking at the different land use, I mean, that that is extremely helpful, and it's not something I, I think I've seen before. So this is new data, a new way of presenting this information you all have um, come to and worked hard on, obviously. So really do appreciate that. And I'm 
before I get into any other comments, I mean, I, you've just shared something that's really impactful, I think, on all of us, whether we've spoken or not. Um, appreciate you sharing that. And you are in an extremely diff difficult position, you and your staff. I mean, you take the brunt of a lot of concerns. And we all know, we hear from people who don't like policies far more than we hear from people who do like the policies, right? I mean, that's, that's just the way it goes. Um, but if there is a way, and I think several people have mentioned this, but I'm just going to pick up on Vice Chair's comments. Um, if there's a way for us to get ahead of those conversations, to help develop that and to avoid the public conflict, and I'm not, I'm not trying to pick out any particular issue here, but the one that came to mind was, um, frankly, something, I mean, it's my district, uh, the city's idea to redevelop the Parks and Rec building. Um, that, that was actually a good location for, I, you know, I'm going to see red flags, red shirts coming up, right? I'm seeing even Wayne Tedder smiling over there, because we do remember this. It, it, it could have been a really good location for infill, for some other type of housing that was complementary to the neighborhood. But when people see a design, their, their expectation of this is going to be, the, the, we're already way ahead of them. And there's a fear, there's protection of the neighborhood, and we, we could all understand that as well. So that, that's, you know, I'm not judge, making a judgment on that. It was just an example that came to mind that <clears throat> perhaps there is a way for us to back up and have this conversation, and we, I think we should, perhaps a different workshop. But we're sitting here tonight with an um, amendment to expand our USA, 300 acres, and then three amendments to allow you know, the uh, changes to take place so that these developments can move forward. And they are substantial. And again, this is not a comment on you all, but we are often in a reactive posture. We, we are here in a comp plan workshop and we receive amendments from developers or from interested parties. Yes, staff is proactive. I think you know, the, you, you've cited a couple of things where you all have looked at whether or not the zoning is compatible, the university transition, things like that. You, you have been proactive. We may need to give our staff more flexibility to be proactive, to really dig in before we get to a point where, as you said, Mr. Maddox, we're facing an ur a massive urban service area expansion, and these are the moments where we hear less from the public, right? We only have two opportunities for the public to come and talk to us about these amendments, and they're complicated and they're big and everything else. When the rubber meets the road and if these move forward and, you know, there's development presented, we're going to hear a lot um, once that happens. But the decision's already been made, potentially, today or in June. So... What I'm, I'm getting to here is I think we're in a rather difficult position because to question a development like this at this point when a application to expand the USA or to move forward in something like this comes through staff, through the Planning Commission, and it gets to us and it's said, you know, this is consistent with everything. It is hard for us to sit here and say, oh, God, you know, we need to draw back and look at the big picture now because we, we are preventing a private sector development from moving forward, and there are rights there and everything else. We want to support that growth as well. So I, I think we really need to take that seriously and perhaps talk about if we want to have a workshop with expanding this discussion, because this is a comp plan transmittal hearing, you know. This is, we haven't even gotten into those amendments. We're just on the background information we asked for last time. Um, with that, and the build out versus build up, we need to give that policy direction. And I think some of the work the, the city's doing with the Neighborhood First Project, Southside Action Plan, is moving in the right direction because really engaging those neighborhoods, finding out what they want, how we can do some infill that is that works with the neighborhood and isn't going towards gentrification. I mean that that's that's what you all are doing, and that's mm -hmm. that is a good thing. Um, I think we can build on that. Um, but again, we have three big amendments, you know, or four big amendments um, that we have to consider this evening. Um, so 
Getting down to that, and Mr. Chair, I've only got a couple of specific questions that relate to the, the details you've shared in this um, additional information that will connect back to those amendments. Um, I, with the caveat, as you say in the item, that the maximum allowed units on Walani English property, uh, Bradfordville Hills, we probably won't reach that max level, right, Because through the site plan process, through the development process. But if we look at those three, did a little math, and that's 24,256 units. Well, based on the population numbers you put up there earlier, that is more units that have already been approved, already been approved, that would get us to 2045 and 2050 numbers. That's, that's it. And we're not even including the 4,000 you know, the, that you mentioned of the possible infill and everything else. So if I look at our policy direction, the commitment we've made to the community about the urban service boundary, we expand it <coughs> if it's needed. We're trying to prevent sprawl. And yet we can show in these numbers that we've already approved in the last couple of years the number of units we need until 2045. That, that's a challenge for me. Again, I don't actually think these three are necessarily in the wrong place. There are other neighborhoods around them, but there will absolutely be pressure on existing infrastructure. There will be added cost, whether it's covered by the developer or not. So not to put you in the hot seat there, but could you reflect on, I mean, just help me out there because I'm doing that math of what we've already approved, but it's not lining up with a justification to expand the urban service area unless it is simply that there's adjacent property that is similar and a developer wants to expand into those areas. I mean, if that's the only reason, I kind of need to know that. Right. There's a, a couple of different policies in the, the comprehensive plan, particularly the land use element, that really kind of talk about uh, when you can expand and kind of why you would expand. Uh, so. Kind of the first one is, you know, where can you expand? So uh, there's provisions with urban fringe and rural that says, you, you know, you're not allowed to expand unless you're adjacent to the urban service area, which is kind of the case here. But when we take a step back and look at the urban service area as a whole, there are really three different, it's two policies, but three different provisions in those two policies that talk about the size of the urban service area. So uh, objective 1.1, talks about how the size of the urban service area relates to the ability to have 90% of new residential development within the urban service area. Again, we want development to be on urban services, not kind of lower density out on septic and sewer, particularly in uh, areas that might be more uh, environmentally sensitive. Uh, but then there's the, a policy under that objective that includes two provisions that really talk about the size of the urban service area. One is it says that the uh, size of the urban service area uh, is based on the capacity to provide urban services. So again, we're not going to expand urban service area out if there are no urban services to connect to. So it's got to be based on the, the capacity to be able to provide urban services. And then the second part of that same policy talks about having 50% more vacant land than is needed to accommodate uh, the projected population growth. And kind of when we were running these numbers, we were ending up with almost a one-to-one, -one, like what we were projected versus what we see approved. And so if we're talking about 50% more land than is needed, uh, I think there's some kind of justification there. Uh, for for doing it from a policy standpoint, uh, kind of note that the comp plan doesn't necessarily include the methodology to use, so it makes it a little bit challenging, which is why we spent so much time really kind of breaking this data down to be able to provide you as decision makers the best possible data that we can. Uh, so we weren't painting a misleading picture the way, I, I don't want to say we previously painted a misleading picture, but when we did kind of look at the aggregate of acreage and the land uses, uh, it did not account for the assemblage of those properties. So we're trying to paint uh, the most accurate picture we, we can. So, um, But I think if you're asking me from a policy standpoint, consistency with the comp plan, uh, really looking at, you know, are you allowed to expand in these areas? Yes, because it's adjacent to the urban service area. 
I got it. Uh, okay. okay. I'm sorry, I just didn't mean to, no, 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 to no. repeat. We've, we've been talking for a while. So, okay, so what I'm, what I'm hearing here is um, based on the current policies and that, that note about the methodology, the fact that you stepped and looked at additional methodology to try to figure this out, I really appreciate that. Push this a little bit farther. But we have a process where we don't have the tools for our staff to address some of the questions that happen at this table earlier in the process before our private sector developers spend a lot of money. It's, a, it's not easy to get all the way to this point. I mean, you've got, you're, you're developing a lot. I mean, it's more to go through site plan and everything else like that, but they're already invested in this process. So it is, you know, I want to take care of our private sector folks, but also our staff. And if, if we're going to ask these questions at this point, and again, I'm just going to keep citing because you summed it up really simply, Mr. Vice Chair, was um, it, there's tension on both sides. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we need more tools to build in there. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm going to go ahead and ask one question that relates to Southwood Plantation Road and April Road, just because we've been in this conversation a long time, and I think we've, we've all heard a lot of those details, so I'm kind of jumping ahead of your presentation here. But um, the, you added some information, the, the traffic counts for uh, St. Augustine, for um, April Road, I mean, for Woodville Highway, Capital Circle, that was interesting too, but I'm, I'm looking at District 5 right now, so um, focused on the traffic counts there. It was very interesting. And you added a note <clears throat> about a county policy related to the April Road parcel, that if um, a parcel like that has access to a road not a, that isn't a canopy road, Appalachia Parkway, they would not be able to access the canopy road. And you, you bolded that. They will not be granted access to St. Augustine Road from that property. That's correct. I said that correctly? You want me to go back to the paragraph? Is that right? Okay. Mindy's got it. Mindy says yes. Mindy wrote it. Okay, I got <laughs> she it. She chairs our okay. canopy road. <laughs> She's the one committees. who bolded <laughs> those two words, will not have access to St. Augustine. So when I've talked to folks in the St. Augustine neighborhoods, that was one of their major concerns, was that that property would have an exit on, you know, would have an egress point on Old St. Augustine, put pressure on the Canopy Road. And when I told them that that note showed up in this item, that made them feel a lot better. So those are the kind of, that, I think that would be helpful to have that kind of information before, um, you know, earlier in the process, because it did address, a, not all the concerns, but a lot of the concerns. So that is one of my biggest concerns on April and that on that section. Southwood Plantation Road, and you just hit on this, it is not, it doesn't trip the threshold for a PUD. So using your example of the English property and the requirement for the developer when that happens to um, expand Paul Russell Road to pay for that. If we don't go through a PUD process for the parcel on Southwood Plantation Road, there's there's no way to require a developer to help improve Southwood Plantation Road. Is that correct? Not unless they have to do concurrency mitigation. They could do concurrency and then we could designate it to that particular road. But it's not a one-to-one. -one. Is that right? Uh, I'm going to defer to Ryan Guffey in terms of in, how concurrency works. In other words, could we stipulate that as a basis for That's where I'm going. The, yes, uh, sir. Permit. That's the question. Yeah. And as Ryan comes up, that would be a city issue. Once, sorry, forgive me, sir. You go ahead. Sure, no Next problem. Question. Ryan Guffey, Land County Development Support and Environmental Management. I'm the concurrency manager for the county, and I work closely with my city counterparts at City Growth Management. Uh, typically, the way concurrency works is, is we do a review at the time of site plan review. And based on the number of units and the access points, we look at uh, how many trips will be generated and where they're going. And then we develop if roadways segments are quote unquote tripped, then we come up with a, a proportionate share of mitigation for that amount of money. And then that money goes into uh, the significant benefit memorandum of agreement, which has pre-identified projects. You could. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Brian, my, my colleagues are I'm getting sorry. hungry here, I'm so I'm trying to pay attention. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Forgive me. 
Yes, Mr. Chair. Yeah, go ahead, go right ahead. <laughs> but that being said, there there could be a possible way that would obviously require, uh, depending on the nature of it, a 163 agreement or a concurrency agreement. If it's over 500,000, that requires board approval. Um, there would be a way of, of, of doing that, uh, but there's there's things you would have to do. Typically, these projects are phased. Yeah. And then you look at each phase as they come in. You can use the background of the, the traffic, but it's it's not sort of cumulative, if you will. So, so what's called committed demand is essentially you add the traffic count to what's in the pipeline. And then those are, are trips that haven't shown up, but they'll show up in the traffic count in a year or two later kind of thing. And then you add the uh, project trips from, from whatever's being developed. And the city and county uh, work closely together going back many, many years, and there's also a policy in the comp plan regarding uh, intergovernmental coordination. And even if, uh, like, for instance, a project doesn't trip something in the county but trips something in the city, they'll still have to pay the city and vice versa. And significantly, for, for these two, Old St. Augustine is county and South of Plantation Road is city, correct? Correct. Okay. So... Um, I may be willing to move forward with these tonight, but this is going to be my big question at adoption. And I, I'm particularly concerned about Southwood Plantation Road. If we're, if we're looking at the traffic numbers that are included in the item, um, Southwood Plantation Ro Road, Old St. Augustine, Appalachia Parkway is already at 86 percent capacity. Hmm. Um, there's 47 trips remaining in that capacity, right. if I'm reading that right. right. So we bring in a big development and if this moves forward, the agreement with Southwood, with St. Joe, to relocate um, Southwood Plantation Road, investment that's already happened by city, county, and FDOT, that goes away. We don't get that 10 million, everything else that comes in to move the road. So th this particular issue, if there is a way to have a better understanding, just even if it's theoretical, we don't know what the developer wants to do, but in conversation with the developer, with you guys, if we can have an understanding of what happens on Southwood Plantation Road, I think that would be something that may help move this along. But right now, that is my biggest concern, because based on what you just told me and other, you know, other things I've... I'm, I'm not sure how this works in that area, and as with every development, and apologies to the developer here, the last guy in pays more than, say, the apartments that are already on South of Plantation Road or, or others, because you, once you hit that mark, you're paying more, correct? Correct. So you could be a free rider yeah. in, in, in the essence, and that's the issue with concurrency, and then the last... Yeah, and the last guy in the door is good, and yes. then, you know, the next project, then they'll have to, you know, presumably pay mitigation if they meet certain thresholds. And that's why we're talking about other options, right? Right. Versus concurrency. So, um, forgive me for, I mean, I, I didn't want to just double down on, or come back and ask those questions later, Mr. Chair. I mean, I just thought I'd package them all in right now, but we got through the high level, but those are the two big concerns I've heard from residents in that area. It is about the roads. And if this moves forward um, in the motion, I'm going to ask for more information on Southwood Plantation because I can't move forward with adoption unless we get some assurance of what's going to happen at that point, even if it happens at the city level. So thank you very much for your answer. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Um, if you allow me to defer to the mayor and I'll come back to our vice chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do have a question, and I do have some comments. But real quick, before we get any further, do we have any public comment? On should we should we take up public comment before we get too further into the discussion? And um, Artie, you got any? Um... We do have public comment on this. Uh, there is Max Epstein, and it would be followed by uh, the representatives of the applicant who are here in support and are available to answer questions unless they decide that they want to speak for the three minutes. Okay, Commissioner, you all desire to hear from the public? Uh, right? Yes. Are okay. The, okay. Only two speakers already? Um, there's four total. Uh, three of them are uh, representatives, representatives of the applicant. So, Commissioner Doge, if we're following what you're doing, we're... Oh, um, can, Barry, can you help get some cards? What we're doing is we're laying all three sides by side by side and have an integrated conversation across 
Mr. Chair, I, I appreciate that. And I, if I had caught myself, I would have saved those two specific points until after public comment. I was just trying to be efficient with my comments there and pack them all into one. Very but well. yes, I think going for public comment now. Okay. Is Permission, if, if that's the desire. Mr. Mayor, is that you sit? Okay. Um, if there are speakers who desire, um, we welcome you to three minute um, input. Uh, first speaker is Max Epstein. Mr. Epstein. Nick, don't haul all the candy. Send it back this way. <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. Chair. <laughs> all right. Hello, Commissioners. Max Epstein, 1001 San Luis Road. I'm glad we're actually having this conversation right now because this is why we get so worked up is because we're not talking about the expansion of the urban services area. We're not talking about these issues of infill development before we get to this point. And I recently just went through this with the English PUD developments, only 494 acres, 10,000 units. And then we talk about Walani that is 4,000 plus units, acres that only has 12,000 units on it. You know, that starts to become a disparity here. And to your um, conversations earlier about the annexation issue, I think that the you need to look at the interlocal agreement and the comp plan to see how the county can have an equal say in this because thousands and thousands of prime acres in the county are moving over to the city. And that's not a bad thing because we do need this sewer. We need the urban services to get there. But we need to have a real conversation about this. And if we are incentivizing through these adding thousands of acres, hundreds of acres, places like South City aren't going to redevelop the way and as quickly as we want them to. It seems to me there are lots of opportunities in the fairgrounds, along South Monroe, other areas in the Southeast sector where this type of development could come. But then when you take thousands of acres and you do Walani, well, that incentivizes the private sector to go up there. There's no reason why they would really go to South City and spend their money there. So these are high level decisions that need to be made. Um, and they need to be talked about first. And unfortunately, it does seem like that there are disparities in our PUD process. I believe Artie said that in the Walani Arch, um, before that PUD, or the PUD for the other stuff, a master stormwater plan had to be developed, and also 40% open space. Well, we went through the English development, there's only 25% open space, and this master stormwater plan will be worked out later. I don't know, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I just heard. And this is creating disparities between the way these things develop. So you have, again, 500 acres on English PUD, 10,000 units, and then Walani, that is 4,500 acres, that's getting 12,000 units. You could build 90,000 units at the same density up there. And we need this mixture. And when you're talking about neighborhood groups coming and all this jazz, we want a compromise. But when we get to this point, it is just, you're right, I'm wrong. It's not. There's something in the middle, and we have to get there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Epstein. Uh, our next speaker, please. Uh, the next speaker is Tor Baynar, followed by Amy Handy. Thank you. My name is Tor Baynar, 2354 Moondance Trail, uh, part of the grassroots community that's off of Old St. Augustine Road. I have, um, I have some questions which I'm not going to get answered, maybe, but one is the 390 commercial units, why no uh, housing? Uh, there are places in the country, in the world, where the shop is on down. You know, on the ground floor, then there's housing for the family, and then they rent the attic for, you know, single folks. I don't know if we, maybe you don't want that model, but uh, staff appears to not want that, that model. Um, 
For six months last year, I bicycled to, to work on Old St. Augustine Road. Once a truck pulled up beside me at the traffic light at um, Southwood Plantation, and he said, you're going to get killed on this road because there's a lot of traffic and it's narrow. Um, I've noticed the large increase of, I mean, it was basically none before uh, uh, Southwood Plantation was built. There was, uh, there's a lot of traffic that goes from Old St. Augustine Road to, to Southwood Plantation, the buildup. And that, it's, it just puts a lot of pressure on that canopy road that um, shouldn't, shouldn't be there, shouldn't happen. And so I very much look forward to, uh, you know, the St. Joe building the, the new Southwood Plantation Road that goes to basically Walmart. Um, I would hope that April Road gets, I was totally thrilled to hear about April Road, the end of April Road closing. Um, I would love for that to get, be clarified that before the first resident moves in, that road is closed. I don't want us, how many years since Southwood Plantation has been there, that we have this extra traffic on Old St. Augustine Road making it dangerous for bicyclists. Um, you know, I, I want to undo that added burden. I want to keep the nature that, that, that uh, you all, your predecessors, uh, created for the Canopy Road. And the final thing, I'm glad to hear something about St. Joe's concurrency requirements, but that's, I presume that that 10 million is not user fees and that there's reasons for that, which I don't understand, but that when a developer develops, there's uh, community costs that are, uh, are very real. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker. The next speaker is Amy Handy, followed by Bobby Joe Finer. Ma'am, please state your name and address for our records. Thanks. Uh, my name is Amy Handy, and I live at 2396 Grassroots Way. I've been there for 23 years. I remember when I moved in um, as a renter, as a graduate student at Florida State, uh, the whole neighborhood was gearing up to, you know, protest Southwood development. And I was just like, what? I don't really protest. I just needed to go to school. But here I am. I, now I'm raising kids, living in this neighborhood, loving our neighborhood. Um, we are way out St. Augustine Road. We are a little neighborhood. I think there are several little neighborhoods. We're not giant landowners with 10 acres each. We all have between one and two acres, um, nice little houses. Um, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm most concerned, and hopefully you answered it, I'm most concerned about the April Road development. Um, I'm concerned, I wasn't sure, I'm sure one of my neighbors will remind me. Um, I know that this, what I'm hearing is that this neighborhood will not have access directly to St. Augustine. Hopefully April Road will somehow be blocked off um, because all these, that neighborhood I think is zoned for Conley, Fairview, Rickards, and if I know anything about parents in the morning getting their kids to school, they're going to take the shortest way they can. And just last night, I tested out April Road. I haven't done that since one of the hurricanes blocked my other ways down St. Augustine, and I turned right onto St. Augustine. I was very careful. My little boy was in the back seat, and as soon as I looked in my rearview mirror, there was a big old pickup truck right bearing down on me. I'm trying to say it's a dangerous spot for anyone um, to be accessing St. Augustine. Uh, so I hope that for everybody's safety, um, that their hundreds of new, develop, new units are not, um, do not have access to St. Augustine. Southwood Plantation Road is just as dangerous as it can be. So I I hope for the people's sake that um, may buy into that development that somehow that road is improved before you put hundreds of units on that road as well. Um, 
None of us like a bunch of development. We love our little peaceful area, our little slice of heaven. I do understand. It's inevitable. Um, one would hope that it wouldn't be, that there's not really a need for that, you know, hundreds and hundreds of units on just a few acres, but um, y'all know best. Just thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Very good. Uh, next speaker is Bobby Joe Finer, followed by Nita Davis. Ms. Finer, if you would state your name and address for the records. Um, I'm Bobby Joe Finer, and I live on Sweet Basil Jane Street, and same neighborhood. And again, my concerns are primarily with the ability of Old St. Augustine Road and, you know, to absorb that. It, if it's true that none of the April Road traffic goes on it, that's a wonderful thing. But I wonder, on the Southwood Plantation, there were agreements in the PUD for Southwood that promised that with the building of Southwood, that that intersection of Old St. Augustine and Southwood Plantation would be closed. Another one to connect Southwood with Appalachie Parkway was to be built a little further west. And that, I mean, you say, okay, there's promises, but this is one that is already Existing, it was made, it was agreed to. And whether or not you know, St. Joe still owns that land, the agreement, I would think, runs with the land, stays with the land, and needs to continue to be enforced by closing that intersection. And that's, I think, the main concern that I have. The rest... Like you said, well, you'll put in, the city will put in sewer, and, well, we won't have wells, and we might even have uh, cable TV. But, yeah, the, the thing that can't be fixed by just putting in city money is the way, the safety of the roads. And uh, if we can keep those off of old St. Augustine, it will be a better thing for everybody who lives in the area. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Nita Davis. Hi. Hi. I know. Here I'm. Here I am. I was at the city last week, a couple weeks ago. Anyway, I just want to say I live at 1111 East Paul Russell Road, right in the smack of South City. And um, I used to have cows for neighbors, actually. They flew over my house when they were building it, and I grew cows, both sides. And um, so I watched a lot of changes, never complained once. I wouldn't live anywhere else. Um, my property was bought from Mr. Paul Russell, actually. And um, it's a beautiful neighborhood. The English property is beautiful free property. And I'm not against development. I'm all for it. I'm all for infilling. But I am not for developing on the headwaters of the Wakulla Springs. And you, all of you, will be responsible if this development isn't dealt with. Because this isn't just another piece of land that needs to be infilled. This is on the headwaters of the Wakulla Springs, which is the largest freshwater springs in the world. Now, and it is disintegrating. We have had people with the statistics. It is still going south, as they say. Just like Blue Sink, I don't know anybody of you swam in it growing up, but Blue Sink is unswimmable now. My grandma had 55 acres on Lake Munson, and she ran a fish camp in the 1940s and early 50s until they built that sewer plant and dumped it and ruined it. But we still could swim in Blue Sink. Not anymore. I was out there two months ago and I took pictures. It's a toilet. So I don't have the statistics. I'm not the expert, but I saw what I saw. And that Blue Sink is the canary 
in the coal mine, because then it goes down to what is the Eight Mile Pond, and then from there to what color springs. So it's on the march. And by the way they want to develop English property, when they pass that PUD, which back in 2012, they asked for all, Harrison, Henderson asked for all those caveats, and they said going forward they would have that. They would go ahead and pass it for the development of the, they didn't want to hold up the um, Veterans Hospital. I was at that meeting. So they went ahead and passed it on that, but there was caveats that going forward address the schools, the, the hydrology, they want a whole hydrology report. Couldn't piecemeal this together. It was too delicate. It went to the city council. City council, a month later, just rubber stamped it. And from what I was told when I met with Mr. White, that's the way it works. It goes away. So this is on you now, how that goes forward. It's the headwaters. Thank you. Uh, the remaining speakers are the applicant and agents for the applicant. Uh, did you want to speak or just if you have questions? They're here uh, if you have questions. Okay. Mr. Ch Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Already, uh, Commissioner Dozier actually asked a very important question, and I'm confused on what the answer was. She asked point blank with the study that we've done, the available land for development currently within the urban services boundary, with the actions that we have taken with Walani, actions that we've taken with English PUD, have we met the demand? If so, why, why are we here? I mean, if we have met the, the 2045, 2050 demand, uh, as suggested, why are we here? Have we met the demand or not? If, if all of the development happens at the maximum allowable uh, development, then we would be very close to an almost exact Demand, supply, kind of meeting together. The comp plan with regards to having the 50% additional vacant land that is necessary is to allow a little bit more flexibility in the market so that we know that our population should not have a one person to one house ratio. Uh, there always needs to be some flexibility in the market. So we don't meet the need to have the additional flexibility in the market uh, and we're also not likely to see the maximum development allowed. So th the answer to that question is yes and no. Theoretically, yes, Theoretically, but yes, from but practically, uh, no. A practically no, and from having additional vacant land uh, above and beyond what you would need to, to meet exactly the demand, um, we probably could use some more. Hence the reason why staff is recommending that we move forward with this, with approval. That's correct. And the Planning Commission as well. Correct. Okay. I, I am prepared to move forward tonight with Transmittal. And let us remind ourselves where we are in the process. We're still at the 30,000 foot uh, level. And Transmittal is when we send to the state. And the state provides comment. And make sure that, that we are in line with our own comp plan. But also provides comment as well on what has been submitted, uh, good or bad. And then it comes back to us. And, and I'm fully prepared to do so. Uh, to my colleagues at the county, you know, last week many of us participated, all of us participated at the city level. I'm sure you heard uh, the meeting at the Richmond Center, uh, two packed houses, um, talking about housing. Mm -hmm. uh, low income, very low income, workforce, affordable, uh, recognizing the, sheer, the, the, the shortage that we have in this community and the need to move forward to provide a product. I also remember not too long ago, and golly, actually maybe it's been a decade now, when we did the community trip to Boulder, Colorado. And one thing that I remember about Boulder was that none of the workforce actually lived in Boulder. Right. The workforce lived an hour away from Boulder and had to travel to and from to work each day because it simply was not affordable. Um, I do not want to get in a situation as a community where our workforce is traveling more than an hour because that's where they have to live in order to come work in our community. Now is the time to properly plan. Mm -hmm. I'm also a strong believer, and I appreciate the data provided by staff, and I was absolutely astonished by attachment number 13 that talked in detail about the fact that our population has grown by 52% 52, 52 since 1990, but yet the urban services boundary has only expanded roughly 2% which I do think shows that our infill policies have been working. 
We have been taking advantage of our infill policies. That's not the end all be all and that's not the answer to every question. And I for one as the mayor of Tallahassee will continue to push for infill, continue for us to think creatively as we have been doing Mayor Pro Tem with our new policies allowing the conversions of motels, looking at state office buildings and state office complex uh, and we should continue to do so. However, I do not think that we can turn a blind eye and say there is no need for growth, period. And I think that we need to work continuously as a collaborative body to make sure that we are meeting the needs today, meeting the needs of the future, not just theoretically, but practically as well. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the balanced growth of our community, Commissioner Welch, bless your heart, your shoulder and the responsibility, it seems, of this entire community and the massive growth. We have an opportunity to now grow on the south side uh, and to really grow, Commissioner Jackson, in your district, which I'm very excited about. And when we look at the vision of where we're going and when we talk to the state, keeping in mind, and uh, Mr. Administrator, I know that you're very familiar with the new proposed EOC that the state will be building down outside of Southwood and some of the proposals that they have about new state offices complex. There are going to be great state job opportunities there that I think will complement the proposed housing. From an environmental standpoint, the thought of growth on septic and wells in the 21st century when we have the opportunity and private development would pay for, let's be clear, private development would pay for the expansion of the urban services into planned developments is crucial. Commissioner Dozier, you bring up a good point. Right now we are at the 30,000 foot level and that's why I'm comfortable moving forward today with all of the proposed amendments. But I do think that as a body we should be more careful with our stipulations moving forward. I do think that we should play more of a significant role in making sure that the planned unit developments do take into consideration our citizens that are here. If we're going to focus solely on infill and ignore growth, you think we got transportation concurrency problems now? We'll never make it. So I do think it's a healthy balance. My position tonight is I'm ready to move forward and will vote to support for the transmittal. Looking forward to seeing what the state has to say before sending it back. But I do think that we have to have these hard conversations and continue to promote urban infill when appropriate, where appropriate, with the neighborhoods there with us in the conversation, but also to promote smart, balanced growth in other parts of our community when it makes appropriate sense as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Um, Ms. Vice Chairman, as our at-large commissioner. Mr. And Chair. Who's speaking? Commissioner Williams. Commissioner Cox. Williams. Commissioner Cox. Williams Cox. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to weigh in um, to say that last week someone shared with me that we have 2,000 realtors and 200 homes in the market. Mm -hmm. So something is going to have to give. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, I'm from Gaston County, and we, you know, I'm sure Gaston County would love to have folks move out in Gaston County. There's plenty of land. I want them to have the opportunity to live here in Tallahassee. And if, if it is a balance that we have to we have to deal with, but we and we have to take the steps moving forward to make sure that we're doing it smart and we're doing it right. But as people continue to move to the third largest state, to the capital city of the third largest state in the union, we cannot turn a blind eye and turn them away. We must continue to grow. And I've said this many times, if we don't grow, we die. And we can't, we can't allow that in the, in the capital city. We're, we're too, we're, we're too, um, beautiful and smart for that. So I, I, I agree that I want to, I want to hear what the state has to say about it, but I'm also listening to what the residents are saying as well. And, you know, in some places, people are saying, uh, NIMBY, not in my backyard. Well, on the south side, we have been saying yes in our backyard, but let's do it right for a long time. So we've developed up north. We need to develop in the south, and we want to do it smartly. We want to do it without outpricing folks. And if you don't have homes, then you know, if you don't have homes for people to buy, then the houses that are available will be so, so costly and so expensive we, we went, may not be able to afford them. So we have to figure out how to get more housing in our inventory. We're having to deal with homelessness. We're dealing with, you know, as, as uh, the mayor mentioned, the, the meeting we were in last last week, 
um, the, the, the uh, re requirement to, to have more um, affordable housing, rental housing and workforce, we if we don't move forward tonight, where do we go from here? And so I'm ready to move forward as well. And let's see where it takes us. But again, we must do it uh, together with our neighbors and we must do it smartly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank Mr. you, um, Commissioner uh, um, um, Williams Cox. Um, Commissioner Richardson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and this has been a very healthy discussion. This is the one that we probably have, should have had a long time ago, even before many of us were even sitting here. We should have had that this kind of discussion uh, because it brings us to where we are now. Um, I, I, you know, I agree that we, we are going to have to grow. We will grow as a community. We can do it the right way. Uh, like many cities have done, we can do it the wrong way, like what we see in Central and South Florida, and none of us want that. Uh, we, we don't want massive development. We don't want to see everything paved over and concrete everywhere and our valuable trees that we all love uh, gotten rid of. So we're going to have to do it the right way. Um, I, I think this is an, an opportunity to start us down that path. I think there's more discussion that needs to be had, uh, particularly as it relates to what I've called, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for mentioning it, or mentioning it, mentioning it earlier, the equitable, de equitable development in our community, which we haven't seen. Uh, you know, as you all know, I, I live on the south side of town, and I think with the infrastructure that we have promised through Blueprint, that is going to create some demand for development uh, in that area as well. And so, yeah, we, we need to start having that kind of discussion. And, you know, I often bring up the G word, gentrification. We've, we're going to have to strike that, that balance. And, you know, one of the things that, that concerns me, and I don't know if Jackie Perkins is still here. I saw her come in earlier, but one of the things she brought to my attention recently is that there's a guy that has brought up bought up a lot of the property mm -hmm. in the bond community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's renting the property to any and everybody, and they're causing all kinds of problems uh, in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so those are the kinds of issues that, that we're going to have to address <clears throat> as we talk about uh, infill development and where it occurs and when it occurs and how best it occurs so that we don't find ourselves by 2045 with neighborhoods that don't exist anymore. You know, I had a lady, um, as a matter of fact, it was at the Cannonball Adderley concert the other day, and there was a young lady who said, well, you know, we used to live where the FSU Law School is now. I, I was floored because that that is what has happened to so many neighborhoods in this community, and I, I don't want to see that happen again. And so we're going to have to plan smartly in that respect, preserving those neighborhoods that have have been the essence in a lot of instances to this community. But we realize that we've got to grow, but we've got to do it the right way. And, and we have that opportunity uh, to set this community along that path. And so I hope that I'm ready to send this to the state for the state's review. That's all it is, is the state reviewing it. Uh, but when it comes back, we're going to have to have some additional discussion about how we grow in this community and accommodate the growth that we know is going to. We're the capital of the state of Florida. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people look at us as a little podunk, you know, city in South Georgia. I, I have to tell you, I hear that all the time. And we do have people right now. Uh, you know, I'd spent 20 years of my professional career in Gaston County working in the school district over there. Midway is, I mean, I, I don't know what percentage exactly, but I can guarantee you a large percentage of the people who live in Midway work right here in Tallahassee. The, well, how do you think Wakulla granted a Publix supermarket? It wasn't because of the people that live in Wakulla. It's those that are, I know one of our police officers, 
he and his family were looking to purchase a larger home. They couldn't afford one in the city of Tallahassee. They're up in Havana now where they could afford a house for he and his family. That's what we're running into if we don't now make the tough decisions. Again, listening to all of our community. I don't want to say that we just heard from this group on this side of town, but all of our citizens and what it is they see is necessary to move our community forward. So that's where I stand on it at this point, but I'm, I, I do believe we still need to have uh, additional conversation on how we move this community forward. And it be, um, and, it, and it include a representative portion of our residents uh, and business owners. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very, very good. I want to make sure that the information the county was given today from our um, economic uh, uh, development office, median house price is $278,000 over the last mm -hmm. year. I don't know where that fits in terms of affordability. But um, our at-large commissioner, Maddox, um, he is our 40,000-foot view uh, person because the rest of us are in these districts. And um, when I come to you, Mr. Um, at-large commissioner, if you could kind of, um, no, no, re no rebuttal, but he's our senior most, senior most. <laughs> has been looking at this for the same range of years. You, you, you saved yourself, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I was intending I to preface. I you were getting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'll, I'll no, she, she, no, no I, you know, I could really get messed up instead of she's been looking at this community longer than he, but I didn't want to go there and get in trouble. Uh, that saves the day. But he has been looking uh, around the same amount of time as the mayor, as our at-large commissioner. So it's very good if he was able to synthesize uh, the views he's heard us say over the years and all of that. But before he comes, uh, uh, Commissioner Minor, uh, the weight of the Northeast is on your shoulder. <laughs> Commissioner Welch, and then uh, our at-large senior commissioner. And Commissioner Cummings as well. Now, Commissioners, I, I want you to know the Commissioner Chairman has been liberal and general, generous all day and time. But it, it, yeah. I only have a class at 10 a.m. in the morning uh, at FAMU. And, I have one at 7.30. Oh, okay. Well, we, at 7.30. <laughs> we can get out by 7.30. But talk as long as you like. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to try to be as quick as I can because uh, I know we've, we've, we, need to, we need to get going. Um, you know, we, I, I think the consensus here, which we'll find out pretty soon, is that I think the, this, this bo these bodies, these two bodies, are ready to transmit. Um, I think I'm going to have I'm going to have more questions. I think many of you will have more questions when it comes back to us the next time. Um, but I, I think this is um, uh, the right step at this point. We need to have investments in the South Side. We need to have investments in the South Side. And and um, as as those investments come, uh, the, the property values of those developments as well as the existing ones will increase. Um, one thing that we as a community, as, as a city commission, as a county commission, need to be very concerned about is making sure that as a community we are also raising incomes commensurate with those property values being increased. Otherwise, we will have gentrification. Sure. Otherwise, we will have people move out of these neighborhoods that have existed for so long because they can't afford to live there any longer. Mm -hmm. So just it's outside of the scope of this meeting right now, but... Whatever we do with the properties going forward with, with the complaint amendments, we as, as two different bodies need to think about what we're doing to develop our workforce, to expand it and add depth to it, so that as, as those property values increase and the south side is, is improving, uh, we also have incomes of the people who live in the south side that can afford to stay in those homes. Um, one thing I, I wanted to, I, I, the representative from the applicant is here, if I'm correct, right? Would you, be, would you please give us, as best you can, I know things are very preliminary, um, as best you can an idea of the type of housing we can expect. Um, <clears throat> I know nothing's set in stone, but I, I, my understanding is that you do have a sense for the types of, of housing you're going to have in these. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Thank you. Robert Volpe, 119 South Monroe Street, on behalf of the applicant. I also have uh, Stuart Hare and Sean Marston. Uh, Stuart is with D.R. Horton and Sean with Urban Catalyst Consultants. Um, I think it would be best if Stuart addresses the, the housing product that they're looking at for, this, for these developments.
Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, 3424 Garden View Way. Um, single family is what we're shooting for. Um, we have a multitude of experience in being the largest home builder in the United States in addressing the fact that all over the country it's expensive right now. People are having trouble getting into housing all over the country. Uh, the way we are addressing it ourselves as the largest provider. Um, we have down payment assistance to the tune of $7,500. That's huge uh, as far as out-of-pocket money. You know, if you haven't been able to save up because of COVID or you haven't been able to save up because of just any reason. We also have credit coaching which uh, takes someone with not perfect credit and we walk hand in hand with those folks and get their credit up so that they can get into housing. Um, the other thing that is really large that we do is we buy federal blocks of interest rates. Nobody else does that. We can say that in this rising interest rate climate, hey, we can provide you a better interest rate and that lowers your monthly payment. You combine all these factors, you're talking, you know, eleven, twelve, thirteen thousand dollars to help somebody that otherwise would not get into housing to get into it. Um, kind of a long answer to your question, but single family is what we're shooting for on April Road, as well as Southwood Plantation Drive. We have single family and uh, townhomes so that we can try to get into a lower price point on the uh, Woodville project. But the whole point is equity generation in the part of Tallahassee that needs it the most. These folks don't need um, just housing. They need the profit off of living in the house to move on with life. And if they can take that profit with them, you, you've, you've really won, frankly, as a uh, city and in a growth uh, area that wants young professionals to stick in town that wants people to move from Nashville and Atlanta and Texas um, instead of them going to Tampa and Panama City and, you know, all these other places. Uh, this city has the potential to be the beacon that, that I think it should be. They just need a housing provider that is capable of dealing with lumber prices that are 374 percent. That's insane over where they usually are. I mean, think about if everything went up 374%. Uh, we're waiting 26 weeks on garage doors, 27, 28 weeks on windows, and we're the largest provider. When we go to Home Depot and say, hey, we need, you know, a window, we need several hundred thousand. So we're first in the pecking order. And with our national contracts, we can get housing down to a certain level. But the truth is, if you get it too far down, there's no equity generation because folks, frankly, don't want to move into it. They don't want to stay in it. Um, so single family, I guess, to answer your question, but uh, wealth generation is, is the point. We want equity to be built in these homes. It, it's it's, it's going to be mixed, different different levels, different uh, mixed development, right? Do you, Correct. Have, do you have a sense for the, the rough uh, prices that you're talking about here? Correct. Woodville, we're essentially uh, walking up. Uh, values from townhouses into single family. Uh, there's a another developer, I uh, believe, across the street doing a build to rent. Uh, mm. We do that as well. I mean, all these things, when you combine them, allow a student to go from apartment living, mm -hmm. stay in Tallahassee, and eventually, as they move towards family and you know job and all that, mm -hmm. move up in the housing structure. You want them to go from apartment, not to Washington or Atlanta or Nashville. You want them to go from apartment to house in Tallahassee mm -hmm. and keep, you know, paying into the infrastructure here in Tallahassee, keep growing as a part of Tallahassee. Uh, right now, there's a multitude of multifamily. So you have apartments galore. And then if you want a house that you think will appreciate, that you don't have to spend fifty, sixty thousand dollars to renovate, you're kind of out of luck. I mean, it's as a thirty-eight-year-old moving from uh, Santa Rosa Beach, 
where things are quite pricey. That's right by Destin. Mm -hmm. We were shocked that Tallahassee is competing for parts of 30A, where we've lived for 15 years, and we, we just lost it. We're like, how is that possible? So we uh, ended up in Killarne, but we're renting because we are waiting on a house that we believe is the right value that can grow in equity. You know, we don't want to make a foolish decision that we're just dumping money into. So, so, I'm sorry, just one last thing and then I'm done. Just, sure. just paraphrase back to you and make sure that, that um, I'm, I'm basically capturing what you're saying. So the, the mixed-use mixed housing is really going to be what you're talking about. So in other words, you're not going to have one large PUD, for example, of low income. It's going to be rather mixed, mixed development so that if you, as you, as you progress in your career, for example, you become a student and then maybe get married and have kids and then mid-career, that type of thing. If you wanted to stay in that same neighborhood, you would have the option to do that. Is that what I'm hearing? What we want to do is provide high quality housing that is at a price level with our help that people can get into. And, and yes, it's mm -hmm. multiple price points, um, but the main point is to get housing. After you, know, you live in an apartment for your whole collegiate career, you don't want to stay in an apartment. You want to move, graduate to a house. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. I really appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the time. Okay, thank you. That definitely exposes a whole new level of um, concepting, and uh, those comments were awesome. And uh, um, we've got miles to go before we sleep on this issue. Uh, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in, in the, um, with the idea that the County Commission still has a general business agenda to attend to tonight, I will be brief. Um, yep. However, I will reiterate what I said at the last meeting, I will maintain that position at this meeting, and that is that I will support the transmittal of the items. I think, again, it's important to, to understand the notion that we don't know everything, but what we, we shouldn't let what we don't know interfere with what we do know, and that is, to everybody's point, we need housing. To the gentleman from DR Horton, they can facilitate that housing because of scale. And so I think all of those things are important. I think it's awesome that everybody's we got kind of a kumbaya going. I feel like the vice chair should lead another Lord's Prayer um, around the table because I think that what Commissioner Dozier is saying is spot on and Commissioner Porter and, and, and the mayor and Commissioner Richardson and everybody I think is we want to balance, we want to be careful, and we want to be intentional, and we want to be deliberate. But at the end of the day, we have to provide product. I am shouldering the burden of the growth in the Northeast, and that is the fact. And then the county, that's, that, there's, I don't think there's any uh, nefarious way that that's happened. It's just organically kind of happened that way. And here you have an opportunity to facilitate some, some housing on the southern part of the county. And I think that is a very good opportunity. I think that all the residents who came here tonight to speak, I think, should take a lot of heart to the, the, the fact that what they've said, those concerns are going to be looked into. Mm -hmm. And because we have very insightful commissioners who know this stuff backwards and forwards, they understand what you're saying, and we're going to look into it before we adopt these comp plans in June. So that's my brief statements on that. I, uh, I will uh, vote to transmit tonight to the state. Very good. I've solicited the views of uh, our at-large commissioners, Commissioner Maddox, and uh, those con thoughts and, and comments from Commissioner um, Cummings as well. Um, Commissioner Maddox, from your lofty view of the whole county, your thoughts. So let's not get in trouble. I'm going to ask permission <laughs> from Commissioner Cummings if, if, I, if, if she would like to go or, you know, she'd like for me to speak. Uh, can you? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. As your junior at large elected county commissioner, just very briefly. I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Commissioner uh, Maddox. This has been very educational for me as your junior at large. County, uh, County Commission. I got that from Congress. <laughs> the but it, it's, uh, it's very, it's a very complicated issue. I, I want all of the citizens that came out and voiced their opinion about this process tonight. I just want to thank you for your input, for your concern. We have gotten emails from many of you. Um, that are here, many of you that weren't, that are not here exp expressing your concern. And I think it's incumbent upon us, the city, uh, and the county mm -hmm. to do, to do what is right. We have to balance the interests of the property owners, the interests 
of the developers and the interests of the citizens in this city and county that are, are in need. We recognize that there is a deficiency in housing. There is a deficiency in affordable housing. But as an at-large county commission, I can assure you that we will definitely uh, be concerned mm -hmm. about the infrastructure. What I heard from many of you all was concerned about the traffic patterns and and uh, the dangerous situations. We have, in my opinion, our county commissioner and with city staff, I believe we have the infrastructure in place to make sure that our homeowners are protected, to make sure that new developers are protected. We will balance the interest and make sure that we have great growth, make sure that we have responsible growth uh, in this city. We want to avoid uh, a sprawl in the county if we can, and I think we're on the road to that. We've got everything in place to make sure Leon County and Tallahassee is a place that our children want to live, where hopefully my son will move back mm -hmm. to. We, we want to make sure that not only are we protected, those of us that live here, but we want to be attractive to others that want to move back here. So I can assure you that that we are concerned, we will remain concerned. I am in support of elevating uh, the proposal uh, as submitted by our staff. And, and let's get some, um, some input. It will come back to us and we will have another opportunity to make sure that we are doing what's right and what's best for the citizens in Leon County. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Mr. Mr. Mayor, I hope at the next mayor chair meeting we could put this issue on to um, mull it over a little, just a little bit more in the next. Uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, I, I think I've told this story before, but one of the last meetings I had with Pam Hall was on her back porch. Um, this was maybe a month before she passed. And she had called me over first time I'd been to her house, and we sat back there, and we had a long conversation about what she had originally taught me when I first came to commission, knowing nothing about urban development or growth. But she taught me everything I knew. And during that conversation, we had this, this thought. Uh, we had this conversation about the fact of Leon County and the city of Tallahassee will always be a one-city one county type situation. And the reason for that is because, quite frankly, utilities. But what you'll end up having is you'll have towns around it. You have villages of growth around it. So what you have is you have Fort Braden, you have Woodville, you have who, who quite frankly, if you think about it, Woodville, with, this, with, with the character of it and the look of it, could possibly anywhere else be a city. Or you have, um, Bradfordville, or you have chairs. And so, so I think what we have to get to in the future and the larger conversation that we have to have, because what I kept he hearing was there's a difference between infill and growth. Well, infill is a type of growth. Mm -hmm. Growth is growth, whether it happens through infill or whether it happens out, outwardly. I think what we try to do is we try to keep that 2.4 as <clears throat> low as possible. But we start, we start being creative about how we look at development out in the rural areas. And when I'm, when I'm saying that, I'm talking about nodes. We, 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 we had the conversation before, but think about it this way. Um, in Fort Bray, there, there's, there's some things that you guys will like out there that will constitute you being some, some kind of growth. But that growth is not going to look, like I said before, like Bannerman or like, or like Woodville. But it's growth that you guys will allow within the area. Define that growth and allow that growth to maximize within Fort Braden. Allow that growth to maximize within Woodville. Allow that growth to maximize within, maximize within these little nodes, right? And within those nodes, you also put, you put, you put amenities so people don't have to travel to Tallahassee to get what they need. So let's say in the middle of Mississippi, maybe there is a grocery store because there's a node that allows for it for those people to go to the grocery store in Mississippi, so they don't have to drive away to Tallahassee. Or within, there may be a farmer's market in Fort Braden or whatever those folks would like. But that's what I think, if you're trying to avoid 
expanding the urban services area. I think you have concentrated growth within these towns that we that have been around forever, that you allow concentrated growth within those towns, within a small, compact area. So those people can have services that, that, that mirror something like urban services, but aren't quite urban services, so they still get their rural feel. Now, on the inside of the urban services area and within the city, I think, again, I said it before, we have to have a serious conversation about what infill looks like. Whether that's us sitting at the table together, I know the city is already having a conversation, and we're going to have to have a hard conversation with folks that it's going to have to happen, right? But it's, it's a balance of the two. It's a balance of that node approach, that town approach, with the urban infill approach, coming together to create a situation to where, let's say, 20 years from now, we may, we may be up another 51%, but instead of looking at 20% growth in USA, we're only looking at maybe another five, maybe 2.5% because of the way we decided to grow. I mean, there's different ways we can look at this, but the thing, the, thing, the, 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 the advantage that we have now that we're dealing with the unintended consequences of before is we can, so I think somebody said it earlier, we have the ability to get ahead of it because we know what's potentially coming. Mm -hmm. So if we don't, it's our fault. If, if, if 20 years from now, commission is sitting here having the same conversation that we had today because we didn't plan for the same kind of growth that we're experiencing right now, then we failed. Shame we on. should build a roadmap for them now so they're only adding to the perfection that we already created because we built on top of what was created 20 years ago. So either we do that now or we fail those commissioners in the future. So, Lord, I mean, 40,000-foot 40, 40, view, that's where we are. And we, and we cannot fold under political pressure because some of this won't be popular. Mm. But it, it's going to be the right thing to do, but it won't be popular. It will not be popular, but it's going to be the right thing to do, the right conversations to have. So that's where I am on it. I, I, am, I am okay with moving forward with the transmittal. I'm fine with that. But I, I wonder if we would be in this situation of having to move forward with this type of transmittal if we had had this conversation five, ten years ago. But you just, you, I mean, you, you know when you know. And now we know we have no excuse to say we didn't know. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 only, I only ask that moving forward we have the hard conversations that we look at things differently when that comp plan comes back already, that you present these types of situations. <laughs> we dig into that no concept. We dig into our, what urban, urban infill looks like, whether it's popular or not. And we talk about potentially what that growth looks like and how we're going to accommodate it. That's all I got. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I, that's why we give you the ball on fourth and two. Uh, Commissioner Dozier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll turn that on. Um, Artie, could we pull up the screen with the options again? Um, your early one, I know we just kind of totally interrupted your presentation and we've gotten into a long conversation, but you kicked off a good conversation with the item and with your presentation, so thank you for that. Um, uh, Commissioner Maddox, I'm going to build on what you just said, that we will fail future commissions, we will fail future residents, people of Tallahassee, if we don't plan in the right way, if we don't do responsible growth, because we've been cleaning up problems that happen. We, I mentioned this at the last meeting. Cascades Park is a cleanup job from a lot of mistakes that happened over the years. A lot of what we do is rectifying bad decisions in the past. So yes, we got to plan. We got to keep growing. We just got to do it the right way. So um, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm I heard you say, you know, discussion and mayor chair meeting is great. We basically had a mini workshop tonight based on one agenda item, and I think there's a lot more detail that could be fleshed out there. Um, so I am, I think this conversation shouldn't wait. We've got a um, <coughs> revision on our inclusionary housing coming back next year. We have a lot of different things coming in the near future. So, I would like to, and if you are ready, Mr. Chair, I'm wondering if, we, if we're ready, based on the conversation, to make a motion on the county side. We have, we have one amendment at the end here, but since we've heard from everyone, making a motion for those four amendments, I think it's four already correct, dealing with um, 
the USA expansion and the three proposed developments to move forward to transmittal. Is that a package motion? I, I'm going to make it a package motion. But I'm going to have two additions to it. So if that's acceptable to you, Mr. Chair, it's just fine. for expediency, because we've gone. Do they have to mirror one the other? The city and the county's motions. So the well, it will not be amending what we transmit. So both uh, city and county would have to vote to transmit. It would have to be clear on that point. If the county wants to add something, they can they can add something. Even if we want to ask the state to take a special review at a particular category of thought or question, we can do that. Okay. If I could get to the motion, I'm not changing what is in the options on transmittal. What I'm going to be asking for is, as I mentioned earlier, additional information to come back in June for the adoption hearing and a workshop to dig into the discussion and get additional information that we've discussed tonight. Very so good. it has no bearing on those on what we transmit to the state. Excellent. Um, but I, I want also to say, and I see Artie's hand if he wants to jump in, that we're not prohibited from seeking an advisory of request opinion from the state as well if we're in a quandary, can't, you know, we just don't know what. And I think that we have that option. Well, the transmittal is that kind of review. Is that correct, Artie? That's correct. And, yeah, yeah, so they will let us know if there are any issues. That's exactly what it is before we have the option to adopt or not adopt. Yeah. If it helps, commissioners, uh, if you wanted to package them together uh, for the county, it would be option three, four, five, and six. For the city, it would be options three and four. Uh, okay. City does not need to take action on uh, five and six. Okay, Chair is entertaining um, that motion from Commissioner Dozier. Thank you, sir. So I'm making a motion for options three, four, five, and six with the addition of bringing back information on Southwood Plantation Road, the concurrency issues, the relocation issues, what infrastructure has already gone in in the past, bringing us that information for our June adoption hearing. And the second would be to have a workshop. I would hope a joint workshop, so I invite my city colleagues to do the same, um, but to have a workshop to develop this conversation um, in full urban service area, all of these, you know, these discussions and to expand on the item um, that we, we dug into tonight. I hope that was clear enough. I've kind of butchered that last part. Clear but enough. thank you, thank you, sir. Yes. That would be the motion with those those two amendments. <clears throat> Very good. We we heard that motion. It was seconded by uh, Commissioner uh, Minor. Was it? Nope. Yeah. I'm sorry. The <laughs> Vice Chairman um, seconded the motion. My voice is deep. And um, are there any <laughs> comments from county commissioners on the motion? <laughs> the chair would would like to weigh in with respect to in general comments which were offered tonight. And I think that, Mr. Mayor, at our meeting, one of those concerns is how do we include transportation uh, in concurrency with each of these uh, uh, expansions? I think that uh, the policy of kicking the can down the road, um, Commissioner Maddox says we, we can't do that or else we fail. Um, some years ago, it's been told that in 1959, uh, the option was before the county to purchase uh, a broad uh, swath of a capital circle, and we fail. Many years later, it costs millions of dollars um, because of what we did not do then. The question that also concerns me is that uh, um, in Southwood, for instance, and I'm thinking about the um, the um, a governor, for instance, who desired to create a Southwood and a new um, state center. And um, got with the largest, say, property owner in the state of Florida, just hypothetical. It occurs to me that the state could easily arrest our local powers to make these decisions if the state so choose. And everything from what we've learned recently from masking uh, to policies related to health and safety, the state has been preempting uh, that rule about don't shoot a gun in a, in a park. The state has told us to stand down. And we've been told multiple times by the state to stand down. And it's occurring to me, in particular because this is the state capital, that we could easily get a governor with an interest with a specific development company, a developer, who would suspend our local powers. I just have to be honest with what 
And I think that the relationship with um, uh, the governor of the years of Southwood um, and having the state component uh, was a, a carrot that made it awfully um, attractive. And because of the huge uh, tendency, of, tendency of the state to occupy that land, it immediately gave it the uh, substantive um, swagger to be an attractive draw of all the agencies that were committed to that land. And I think that we have to think in terms of where we are. The tendencies of uh, government in recent years, that we just don't know how long these decisions will be in our hands. So understanding the dynamic, the unraveling of what we've known as a traditional uh, state-local relationship, I think that we really ought to do all that we can to, um, as Commissioner Maddox has said, to set the um, groundation of policy and set the groundation so that the foundation of what we're doing can have a level resting and secure resting spot. So I appreciate the motion for Commissioner Dozier because there are dynamics out there um, which we've all you know, nibbled on a little bit that we've got to take that deeper, deeper dive. Hearing all the um, comments uh, on the motion coming from the county, all in favor of Commissioner Dozier's motion, please say aye. aye. It passes unanimously, Mr. Mayor. Excellent. From the city side. I move uh, staff recommendation options <coughs> three and four with the amendments uh, adopted by the county. Excellent. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second the motion. Okay. I'll second that. Okay. I'll, I'll give it to Commissioner Diane Williams-Cox. Uh, further comment, I'm not an attorney. When it comes to the governor's administrative powers, I think your county attorney is probably the best to speak, and I'll let you do that on the county meeting time later on tonight. But it's my understanding that even as governor of the state of Florida, unless it's a declared state of emergency police state, he cannot single-handedly observe local powers. That would be a legislative action that would have to go through the session. So that is a whole other fight. Mr. Chairman, you are correct on that, that we have to watch. Uh, each and every year, but I'm pretty confident that the governor couldn't do it all on his own unless it's a state of emergency. But I, I'll let the county attorney address that during y'all's meeting later on tonight. we got a motion on the table. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those aye. opposed? Aye. Nay. Okay, passes 3-2 with uh, Commissioner Matlow and Commissioner Porter in opposition. Okay, Ms. Mayor, before you uh, part, uh, are we finished? No, we still have one more amendment, don't we? We just know that there is one more amendment. It is considered a small scale. Uh, there's no action needed tonight, uh, but it would be on the agenda for June 14th. Uh, the applicant has filled out a speaker card, though. Cool. Is there a speaker? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Please come. Please come. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. I'm Jim King. Do you need my address? Six, yes, no? 6650 Havana Highway, Havana. I'm talking about this little piece of land. Uh, survey actually says it's 0.51 acres. It's on Financial Plaza, which is along McClay Commerce. Directly west of me is a big chunk of land that's going to become an an urban pedestrian park. Uh, this little piece of land has had an odd history. It used to be part of a PUD, the McClay Hammock Subdivision, back in the 90s. And at some point, the city bought a big part of it, which is now going to become uh, a park. When Things got rezoned, uh, the rezoning nomenclature, whatever, uh, happened in the early 2000s. That big piece that's going to become part was named government operations. Mistakenly, my little piece, which wasn't part of what the city bought, also got uh, zoned as government operations. Should never have been done that. All the rest of the property around me is activity center, which is what we're asking. Uh, I have sold Christmas trees in this town since 1985. I'm selling trees there now. I bought the land. Uh, I plan on being a good neighbor. 
And uh, one of the interesting things I want to do is build a, instead of your basic natural area with uh, painted wood chips and sod and some ornamental plants, I want to build a raised bed uh, native wildflower garden in there. The water, the storm water coming off the building will be funneled underneath this whole garden, kind of like a septic system, so that we, uh, the plan is to have zero uh, storm water. Uh, and even though it's, I believe, well, and, uh, that's, you don't need to know that. But it'll be nice. <laughs> it'll be nice. There is uh, plenty of room for parking on that parcel. I'm, I'll be required to have 16, although there is a totally empty parking lot to the east of me, the extra regions bank parking lot. There is a totally, uh, way more than totally empty parking lot to the west of me, where the, uh, between me and the city land, where the park's going to go. City should think about condemning that. Uh, and claiming <laughs> the city parking. Uh, anyhow, I've heard the, the, the ding dong here. The whole thing is, I plan on being a good neighbor. This is a good zoning thing. It'll be keeping us, my parcel, in harmony with everything around me, and uh, it'll be nice. Very good. We, we thank you so much. Yeah. Mr. Chair. Okay. Just Commissioner Dozier? Really quickly here. Christmas trees and pumpkins? Or no longer pumpkin? You don't have to. It's, it's okay, Jim. Okay, I heard the sign. Um, but, yeah. Okay, pumpkins are heavy. Um, well, I just, I just had to take a, a personal moment here and say I can vouch for Jim King being a good neighbor because we were neighbors from when I was born for a very long time. And um, I am glad that you have worked this property and worked the Christmas trees for a long time. And I'm glad you're taking this step. And um, this, is, this is exciting. You always have a great environment for families, everyone to go. So thank you for that. I just had to take that moment. You know, if you need, if you know anybody that wants to self Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. King. We're very grateful. Um, is there a need for a motion? Is there anything for us to do? Okay, no action. We consider our meeting. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. This would be very, very quick. Okay. It, it was something I brought up at the workshop. Um, I just I mentioned it at the workshop, and we I think there was general consensus. Um, I just said I would wait until today. We had for um, amendments that are 50 acres or more. Um, we have, and already correct me if my notes were wrong here, but. Um, we notice everyone within a thousand feet of the parcel, but for those large scale amendments, we had talked about expanding that notice more broadly. So I'd like to make a motion for staff to bring us back a policy recommendation on what that radius should be for um, parcels above 50. County has a motion and a second for a notice um, provisions to be brought back. Uh, is there any discussion? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, a great motion. Is this the appropriate form? Madam Attorney, or how should it be brought back for consideration? Since that wasn't on the agenda and is not germane to this particular public Correct. hearing, I would, I would recommend that be brought in our commission time. That'll work. Commissioner Tom. Thank you. Um, but I'll be more than happy to bring it up at the city at our next meeting as well. I wanted to bring it up now because we had discussed it at the workshop and it needs to work concurrently between the city and the county. So yes, Ms. Mayor, if you would bring it up at the city, I will bring it up in our comment time tonight. Um, but I do think having that discussion when we do our adoption hearing together would be um, appropriate. Madam Attorney, would that be, could we at least have that discussion even if the city and county voted on that policy separate at our adoption hearing in June? I am so sorry. I was distracted by that, that's the just dramatics. Fine. I, we, we will blame the vice chair for that. I am, I am asking if, if the city and county both take a motion separately to bring that agenda item back could that be included in our adoption hearing in June so that we can discuss it jointly at that adoption hearing, even if we have to take votes on it separately? If it's included on the agenda, there should be any problem with that. Thank you. That would be my ask. Thank you. Okay. We, so we don't need a motion, is it? No, sir. Okay. Very good. Com commissioners, before we adjourn, before we adjourn, adjourn, this is not germane to the meeting. I hate to end on this particular note, but a legislative session next Tuesday, uh, our community is one of two communities that will likely um, take a hit uh, with, with speculated proposals. 
to annihilate uh, Congressional District 5. Uh, it's my hope that uh, if you have vocal voices, our community, the capital of, of, of Florida, the capital community of Florida, to my recollection, has never not had at least one Democratic voice representing a county community with 58 percent Democratic voters. Uh, I don't know your sensitivities. Um, I'll be exercising my own personal and individual voice because the citizens in my district will be impacted. And um, I'm hopeful that city commissioners will give um, um, interest to uh, what will happen to us um, without a Democratic representative representing our community. We're a commission that has, um, I think, all Democrats. Thank you all very much. We are adjourned. Public comments yet? And I, I've been waiting for like two and a half hours. Please don't leave. I mean, we have another public comment. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're, oh, you guys are just taking a break? No, 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 no. no, no, no. This was the no. Joint well, does she have a card in? My understanding is oh, okay. the county meeting is still going to be going. Did, yeah. okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's not on the comp plan. The county meeting, we're. we're oh, you're going back up there? Yes, please, yes, up there. Yes, she there. Yeah.
um, for the continuation of our uh, board meeting, general business, Ms. County Administrator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This item uh, requests the board to conduct the first and only public hearing to consider a proposed ordinance amending the official zoning map related to the former Coles location on Thomasville Road. The property, including the building and the parking lot, is currently split, in, split into two different zoning categories. The applicant is requesting a change uh, to a single zoning district, the Bradfordville Office Residential Zoning District, which is considered a down zoning because it reduces the maximum development intensity allowed and provides uh, for a planned reuse of the uh, existing vacant building. Uh, commissioners, I believe we do have uh, a couple of speakers on this item. We're happy to uh, take any questions that you might have. We're recommending uh, option one. Which item are we on? We are on item number 29. Which one? I, public hearing item number 29. Okay. Do we have any speakers? I believe we have uh, speakers uh, who are the developers' representatives. I believe they're here to answer any questions, if the board uh, pleases. Commissioners, but, are there any uh, questions of the developers on item 29? We, we, we have no commission questions. Okay. Is there a motion for adoption? Okay, we have a motion for staff's recommendation on item 29. Is there a second? Yes, Commissioner Jackson. Okay, Commissioner Doja seconds. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Passes unanimously. Our next item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our next item, item number 23, it puts us back on the general business agenda, uh, is um, as requested at your last meeting, Commissioner, provides an overview of Leon County and the HFA, our Housing Finance Authority's uh, respective roles in conduit financing. Uh, including a review of the HFA's public engagement process. Additionally, commissioners, as requested by the HFA, the item seeks the board approval to authorize the HFA to issue bonds in the amount of $55 million for the Ridge Road development. This is all included in the item before you, commissioners. Uh, the conduit financing, uh, again, uh, is a means for private companies and, and uh, other organizations to raise capital. Uh, via tax-exempt municipal bonds to fund large-scale projects that will benefit the general public. Conduit financing does not require uh, direct financial support to a project, and, and neither the county nor the HFA is liable or financially obligated for the bonds as a result. Uh, approval does not impact the county's bond rating. Uh, pursuant to policy and statutes, the board, however, is required to approve any HFA bond issues. Uh, as such, in the last three years, the board has approved the issuance of three affordable housing bonds for a total of about uh, just over $100 million. Uh, for this project, uh, uh, the HFA is requesting the board consider the issuance, again, of $55 million uh, in bonds. The project would build uh, 250 rental units on vacant property and set aside a portion of the property to build single-family homes in partnership with the Bethel Baptist Promised Land uh, CDC. In response to the board's, concer the board's concerns raised uh, regarding public outreach for the project, as included in your materials, the developer has uh, memorialized in detail how they will engage uh, the surrounding residents and neighborhoods through uh, multi-in-person and virtual meetings beginning in May in coordination with the Promised Land CDC and other stakeholders. Should the board approve the bond issuance, commissioners, no funds would, re would be released until the HFA completes its credit underwriting process and is uh, and closing is scheduled, uh, which is expected to occur in spring 2023. Uh, finally, commissioners, uh, the item recommends accepting uh, $50,000 from the HFA uh, for the county's emergency home repair program, which provides emergency assistance to low income homeowner, homeowners with repairs uh, such as roof replacements. We're recommending options one, two, and three. Uh, commissioners, uh, we have uh, Shington Lamy here. We have the uh, Ridge Road developer, John Shepard, in attendance, as well as Mark Hendrickson with the HFA. All happy to answer any questions that the board might have. And I do have a couple of speaker cards. Okay. Uh, commissioners, before we uh, get started, I want to hear from the developer. Uh, I was ill yesterday. Uh, I think that in our last meeting, um, the idea was to... Um, get a, a sort of uh, who, who are these folk, uh, their purpose, I raised the issue of the 250 units um, condensed in that, that, that small property. Um, the sense of the property um, being surrounded all by 
uh, detached units. Um, in fact, you will find uh, between Spring Hill Road and Crawfordville Road, uh, with the exception on Spring Sacks, there are, I think, three triplex, triplexes. But there is nothing between Spring Hill Road, uh, bounded by uh, Adam Street, or rather Crawfordville Road, uh, Capitol Circle, down to um, Bragg Drive. Um, there is nothing of this colossal nature. And so tonight, uh, with the item to approve, to authorize HFA to issue a $55 million um, bond for these units on Ridge Road, um, I, I feel sort of like this item is backdoored. And it seems to me that it's, uh, it runs counter, that even as a suggestion tonight, uh, prior to, there's been no neighborhood um, involvement, uh, the community doesn't know about it, and we're doing the exact same thing which the chairman uh, had prayerfully asked that we not do, and that was before we got to a $55 million endorsement support that the community, uh, the people impacted, and none of those um, 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 elements of request have been observed. So I'm puzzled. And I'd like to um, pass the chairmanship to the vice chairman because I just don't have, uh, um, what was that? Y'all said something? Okay, so I don't want to preside over this issue because it's the same one that I didn't want to uh, see go through the last time. All right, do we have any public speakers? We do, Mr. Vice Chairman. We have one uh, speaker, Kendra Light. Okay. That concludes our speakers. All right. Um, I believe the developer's here. Um, I think I have Commissioner uh, Cummings who wanted the floor for a second. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Vice Chair. Uh, I just wanted to um, express a conflict on the record, mm -hmm. uh, perception of a conflict pursuant to Florida Statute 286.012. Uh, one of the potential subsidiaries um, on this particular uh, project, Promised Land CDC. Uh, I am the general counsel to the parent owner mm -hmm. of that particular uh, CDC. And even though I don't expect to receive any uh, direct financial benefit yes, if there is a potential of uh, eventual contract with CD, with the CDC and the developer. Um, I want to avoid the perception of a conflict, so uh, I'd like to de declare that on the record. Let the record show that and that's with, I'm sorry, that's with options. I would have a conflict with options one and two. I don't have a conflict with option three. Is that correct, Madam Attorney? Uh, option one is just to uh, accept the status report, so there would not be a perception of conflict just accepting the status report, but it would be uh, applied to option number two. So option one and three? Two. One and three, which there's no perception of a conflict. Commissioners, um, Commissioner Dozier, can we just take up one and three? Yeah, um, make a motion for one and three. Um, options one and three have been moved by Commissioner Dozier a second. Seconded by Commissioner Jackson. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 6 0, Commissioner Chairman Proctor out of Chambers. Now we will take up item number two with Commissioner Cummings recusing herself. Let that be known for the record. Commissioner Dozier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am. Um, or, or Mr. Vice Chair, I should say. And the Chairman already noted, or the County Administrator already noted. Um, Shane Lammy, Mark Hendricks, uh, Hendrickson, excuse me, it's been a long night. And John Shepard, who's a developer, thank you, gentlemen, for sticking with us. Kendra Light was here. She um, messaged me before she left. She is chair of the city's um, affordable housing committee, the compliment. I'm sure, Mr. Mr. Vice Chair, you work with her. Yes, ma'am. Um, she, I believe, will email us her comments. Um, she had uh, some just general thoughts about this. I haven't seen the email come through, but I think we will receive her comments at some point. Um, I've had the uh, chance to meet with um, both the developer and the HFA. I, I think getting a, an understanding of the HFA process, this is 
not something that we have done many times, to be sure. Mm -hmm. um, it would be my hope that we see more of these um, opportunities come to us in the future. And to the chairman's concern, it is my understanding that getting the financing approved for the bond, and Mr. County Administrator, I believe you said a moment ago that <coughs> no dollars are, are expended until there, there are many more steps in the process, but we need this approval to show Florida Housing, uh, I believe it's Florida Housing Finance, others, um, other funders that the project has the financing so that they can move to those next steps. Is that correct? Mr. Mr. Administrator, before you answer that question, Commissioner Doja, if you don't mind, at this late hour, I definitely want to go by policy. Would you mind making a motion? Oh, um, not at all. I'll make a motion for option two. Option two has been moved by Commissioner Doja. There's a second to that motion. Seconded by Commissioner Minor. Mr. Administrator? That's correct. Yeah, that's, true. that's correct. That's correct. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. That was so simply. Okay. I'm glad I understand that properly because I do have a lot of confidence that neighborhood meetings, there has been a commitment to neighborhood meetings. And I think the work with Promised Land is very, um, oh boy, I know I'm tired when I was about to say promising. Um, <laughs> sorry, I had to, I had to do that. Um, and I, I understand the chairman's concerns about, you know, and hey, we just had a multi-hour conversation on pushing through developments and how we're going to engage the public and all, you know, at what point that happens. We just made a la major land use decision and the specific conversations won't happen. Well, we made one step in that process. The sp specific conversations won't happen until they get into the development review process. Yes, so in the same vein, I think we're here approving a bond issuance so that the developer can take the next steps and in the same vein as our conversation that we need all types of housing options. I am glad that people are looking at Leon County um, and Tallahassee as an opportunity to invest and um, to diversify some of those housing. And with that, um, and I actually don't have any questions, Mr. Shepard, because we spent some time together yesterday. I would just mention that I was happy to hear that there would be mixed incomes in, um, in the development. I mean, that harkens back to a conversation we had years ago at the CRA about um, affordable housing, you know, really structured in a different way with mixed incomes and then next to the single family. So I am happy with this item. I'm glad. I hope it does move forward. And that would be it, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Chairman has given me the authority to drive this thing home. Commissioners, it's about nine o'clock. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to ask if there's any more commissioners that would like to speak on this item. If you do not ask to speak right now, I'm going to go to a vote soon as we finish with these comments. So is there any other commissioners that would like Chairman to speak? Chairman, I'd like to weigh in on this one. Yes, sir. Sure. Commissioner Thank Chairman you, Proctor. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, you gave a, a noble um, uh, 40,000 view uh, uh, aerial approach to how you saw our county. One of the things you mentioned that uh, resonated and actually uh, uh, captured my thought centers was that you said that areas such as Fort Braden, to use specifically your, your reference, um, each area would develop within its own character, its own uniquenesses, uh, and there would be no necessarily a carbon copy of what you do here, would be um, um, forced upon another area. I, li I like what you said. And to your point, uh, specifically, this project uh, or tends to be so far of character uh, of what exists surrounded by seven, eight neighborhoods. And if, and if we're true to your vision of what you see at 40,000 feet, then we would be, or you would walk back your assertion of how we ought allow different areas of the community to develop. Now, 250 units. Uh, in some areas, may work. Let's say Orange Avenue. I, mean, I think that's anticipated. But 250 units in this specific location um, is a lot. We don't need to ghetto fi the South Side. And I don't care whose money it is. I grew up on Ridge Road. I give a damn. Black Lives Matter. But we can't put any old thing down there. I heard Commissioner Williams-Cox tonight say, the South Side is open, our doors are open. 
we said to Commissioner Welch, I say to him, uh, I want to take some of the pressure of the growth being on your shoulders in this community. I, 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 I like to carry some of that weight, but not any kind of weight. And it violates due process in my concept of public engagement and due process of people being noticed. And I think I heard tonight someone say moments ago that for large units that we give a notice to a wider aerial um, base of citizens who live around those areas and are impacted. This is certainly an extremely large uh, area, uh, facility, situated on a street that simply, speaking of concurrency, has no road capacity to bear this intense um, development. So um, I think that we're definitely moving much too fast. We have not had uh, a basis of scrutinizing uh, the project. And I want to apologize to the gentleman who desired to meet with me. And um, I apologize, sir, that um, I was in the emergency room yesterday morning for the better part of the day. And it's my daughter and my mama's prayers that I'm here right now. Mm -hmm. So when you offered to speak with me, um, I desired to, but was unable. So I have not lost track, though, of my uh, concerns. And I feel like this is a, a run over. I feel like uh, we have not achieved. Um, I did speak with the chairman. Um, I did meet with um, the financial advisor, F HFA. This still does not anyway substantively speaking with the, uh, the developer or the chair of the HFA or the um, financial person of the HFA still does not subs substantively uh, meet what I think is due process uh, criteria for the public engagement. And I think that this should really be delayed um, until after, and I think that I was going before the HFA and got a notice last week that that meeting uh, has been moved from, from, and has been delayed, the HFA's meeting. But I think that this should certainly wait until after the HFA has met. We would not treat any, any side of town except the south side and put them in this posture to catch up once you let this horse out the barn. These people can wait if it means anything to them. That piece of property been down there for, well, my family's lived on Ridge Road since 1961. And I don't think that dirt is going anywhere before we allow the community a voice. If you desire to run over those people, not give them a voice, that's your option. You, you're elected from your districts. But as the district's representative from that area, I simply desire for them to get a front end uh, input conversation, respect, if we can afford them that. I don't know if a motion is on the floor, Mr. Chairman, but I'd like to offer a substitute motion that we delay um, taking this matter up until after the HFA has had their next meeting and until communities uh, have received more than a, a, a two-minute uh, opportunity to public hearing uh, from a public notice that was placed on the website of the HFA. And, sir, I don't read that web page myself, and no other members did. So I, I, I'm strenuously uh, respecting all the voices I've heard about growth and development that we've just shared, housing and all of that. We badly want it. We want something. But we don't know if this is what we want. And I'm asking you to please give the people of the South Side a chance to um, get factored with their voices um, and not just the bigs and us deciding. That's my motion. Uh, so, so, so motion motion's been made by the chair to postpone this item until after HFA has met. Uh, Mr. Administrator, when is, when is that meeting? Do you know? 
Mr. Vice Chairman, I'd have to defer to Mark Hendrickson, who's here with the HFA, to respond. Mark, can you come up for a second? Yes. Um, Mark, you've, you've heard the, the chairman's request. Can you, can you speak a little bit to the logistics there? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think that, that um, we would much prefer that you move forward at this time. There's, there are issues unrelated to whether the dirt will still be there in two or three weeks. There's private activity bond allocation that is competitive, and the, there is a region there's the, it is a first come, first serve, and every day that we wait is a day that someone else from this region can get the bond allocation and Leon County doesn't. We have no idea if somebody will step in front of us, but every day is a chance that we lose that bond allocation and, and it goes somewhere else. So we, we. Understood. Is there a second to the chairman's motion? Motion dies for lack of a second, Mr. Chairman. Can I speak to the motion? I think that, um, again, but for who those people are on Ridge Road and surrounding areas, we would not do this to anybody else. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, any more comment? I, actually, I said I don't want to take any more comment. I will say that, you know, we, we, had, we did see this. We asked for a postponement for more public uh, engagement. Um, Mr. Lamb, you come up for a second, please, and I'm going to go straight to a vote after that. Since, since our last meeting, when we asked for that more public engagement, did, you, did we in fact get that, that we, which we asked for? Yeah, we have gotten commitment from the developer. We, they will be scheduling meetings in May with the neighborhood, as well as there is a meeting scheduled, a development review set by the city DRC regarding the subdivision of that property scheduled for April 25th. I mean, like, I mean, more different approvals would have to go through before Dirt's turn. So, um, when it comes to the on the city side, there'll be a couple of more times where it'll probably go before the DRC mm -hmm. um, for a review um, prior to development. And then, as our Mark has mentioned, and as the developer has mentioned in your previous meetings, when he has met with you, also is that um, this is really at the beginning stages yes. where there's going to be opportunities where. Um, they're through the development process as well as an engagement by the developer mm -hmm. um, that uh, that there will be opportunities where they will be reaching out to the community and the neighborhoods to make sure that they're aware and get input regarding this um, proposed project. Staff recommendation been moved by Commissioner Dozier, seconded by Commissioner Minor. All those in favor of the motion before they indicate by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries six to one. We'll move now to item number 24, Mr. Administrator. Madam, um, County Madam Attorney. Attorney. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. So uh, this item has come back to the board. Um, it was first considered in an agenda item last June. Um, at that point, the uh, board had requested additional uh, analysis, including financial analysis and a determination about what it would take, if possible, to obtain a uh, delegation from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection uh, for a local air pollution control program. Uh, under the regulatory framework that currently exists in Florida, uh, Department of Environmental Protection is responsible for implementing the Federal Clean Air Act uh, and the Florida Forestry Service within the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services um, is responsible for implementing and enforcing regulations for open burning. So those, those two uh, jurisdictions uh, kind of overlap because of the air emissions that result from open burning. Um, a number of years ago, um, DEP delegated to uh, for the Florida Forestry Service its authority to regulate open burning, uh, with the exception of eight specific counties uh, for which DEP had already granted local air pollution control programs, okay? So DEP only responds to open burning complaints at commercial businesses and permitted facilities, uh, and complaints related to residential open burning are currently referred to the Florida Forestry Service. Um, there are uh, state laws and the statutes, but also uh, primarily in rules adopted by DEP and by the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services 
that set current standards uh, for different types of open burning. Okay. Um, specific to Leon County, the Florida Forest Service currently has four fire rangers who are responsible for managing and responding to open burning complaints. They are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, however, they only respond to complaints when there is an active fire. So if people call when there's not an active fire, they're going to be told, please call us back when there's an active fire for us to investigate. Um, at the July 13th, 2021 meeting, the board did consider that status report that I mentioned before. Um, the list of permissible conditions to burn uh, yard waste and trash uh, are on page 794 of the agenda item. Um, please note that there are other standards that apply when other types of matter are being burned, so that is not an exhaustive list of the regulations that currently exist uh, in state rule. Um, but right now, um, what is before you is um, information about a delegation from DEP. You could request a complete delegation of the entire air quality program um, and the financial impact to the county to do that is outlined in your uh, agenda on page 796. Um, the approval process could take several years, after which time the county would be eligible to receive some state dollars uh, to administer the program, but it is not anticipated that that uh, funding would be sufficient to cover all program costs. Um, the other option is to request a delegation of only the open burning portion of the air quality program. Um, that would be permissible for DEP to delegate that. Um, again, those estimated costs uh, are outlined in the agenda item for your consideration. Um, and then finally, Section 18-142 of the Code currently includes a statement that the State Forest Service has delegated all per permitting authority in the county's unincorporated area in accordance with the State Forest Service's outdoor burning and forest fire regulations and law. That is a complete misstatement of the status of the law in this area. We have, we have not effectively delegated anything to the county. It's the other way around. Uh, the state has preempted our authority to regulate open burning without a delegation to the county. For that reason, uh, I have recommended and request uh, that the board uh, approve uh, bringing back an ordinance to repeal uh, that provision in the current code. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. No, I'm sorry, is there anything that prevents us from having a um, uh, air committee of sorts? I am so sorry. Uh, air committee, is there anything that prevents us from having that just as an ad hoc committee? And do we already have that, Mr. Administrator? Do we have a, like an air committee, like a... You know, Air quality committee? Not that I'm aware. We have a science advisory committee. Who, science committee yes. that covers that. Okay, thank you. We have uh, uh, four speaker cards. Okay, uh, let me get the speakers. Thank you, Madam Attorney. Uh, the first speaker is Stephanie Lawler. Uh, Madam, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. County Administrator, uh, Ms. Lawler has had to leave. Thank you. Next, next, speaker. next speaker, Linda Summerlin. Linda, welcome back to the chambers. Name and address for record, please, ma'am. <laughs> Being late to one of them. <laughs> Commissioners, we just want to simplify this by saying if we could do something like prohibiting burning in a subdivision that has less than an acre of land. I've looked through, and there must have been a lot of counties that got grandfathered in because I looked at quite a few counties that have burning ordinances. And they all indicated what I wanted to ask y'all to do. And then they went to Department of Agriculture and Department of Forestry for the larger things. Pinellas County has a great burn ordinance. And out of that, one of the things I wanted to ask you to include was a recreational fire is one which is located inside a container such as a grill, a portable fireplace, or designated fire ring. And the total fuel area does not exceed three feet in diameter or two feet in height. We have a really lovely neighbor who has convinced everybody that his burn barrel in his backyard 
is his recreational burning barrel or burning fire. Or is it, is, he thinks it is no different than having a fireplace outside or a ring fire. And there's nothing to speak against this. So he, he's allowed to do it. I have called the forestry department one time, and about 30 minutes later, a truck came, and it was a huge truck with the largest piece of fire equipment tractor that you've ever seen. And I felt like, wow, that was a waste of money for their time and everything. And I felt really bad about calling them. Bec here again, they couldn't do anything about it because he calls it a recreational fire pit. So that's one thing we'd like to address. The other thing would be in subdivisions with less than one acre of land and one that has pickup by any company for waste or household and you can't burn. It, it's whether you subscribe to it or not. Like when we had Waste Management come or Waste Pro come to pick up. Is that my ways to have to go now? You got a little bit of time. Okay. Um, I want to tell you a little story that just happened. I called the, fire, the uh, forestry department and spoke with someone there, and I was told, well, we don't have any burning permits. I said, I know my neighbor doesn't have to have a burning permit. He just burns. Well, that happened to be the, and it was very dry. It happened to be the time when all the fire was in the panhandle. Well, all the forestry people were there taking care of that as they should be. So they in turn called the sheriff's department. Well, the sheriff's department called me and I said, oh, you don't have any jurisdiction. Don't bother to come. Well, they said, well, they called us and we've got to do something. I said, why do you have no jury? Oh, we're not going to come. We're going to call the fire department. I said, don't call the fire department. They don't have a jurisdiction. Well, they did anyway, and a fire truck came, and he met him at the front door. I mean, you know, he went to them, and they never went to the back. They, never, they were probably here a minute a and a half now, to two minutes. Time, yeah. We have no recourse whatsoever. And I don't know. All I want you all to do is add four or five sentences, one that deals with the subdivisions with small tracts of land, the fact that if you have in your neighborhood um, waste pickup and yard pickup, you don't burn whether you subscribe to it or not. Mm -hmm. Pinellas County has their local law enforcement people and the fire department. That's who goes out. They're local. You don't have to bring the big equipment and the people from the forest. That's some of the extra times. And uh, the last thing is the penalties. Pinellas County has some tough penalties. Thank you. Um, and I don't know if you have to go through the... One last thing, though. Can you give me your, your name and address for the record, please? Oh, I'm so sorry. My name is Linda Summerlin. I live at 2048 Falk Drive, Tallahassee, 32303. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. All right. Do you have any no, questions Mr. Mr. Vice Chair. That's it. Yes. Uh, point of information, Pinellas County was granted authority, a delegation from DEP, and has the delegated authority okay. for a local air pollution control program. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sumner, thank you for your comment. If we have any more questions, we'll call you up. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Minister, next speaker. The next speaker is Rory Reese. How you doing, Ms. Reese? Name and address for the record, please, ma'am. My name is Rory Reese. I live on Car Lane in Tallahassee, Florida. Good evening, County Commissioners. March 3rd, 2022. WCTV reports that there is a 100-acre fire in Taylor County the very next day, March 4th, a wildflower, wildfire on Tallahassee's north side reignited late Friday afternoon. According to the Tallahassee Fire Department, roughly 100 acres had burned by the time crews had the fire contained around 1 p.m. Around 6 p.m., crews had left the scene, but flames sparked back up. A WCTV crew called 911 after spotting the flames and a subsequent explosion was caught on camera. The next day, March 5th, 
In Bay County, Florida Forest Service reports that the Atkins Fire is currently 1,400 acres and growing. Florida Department of Emergency Management reports eight homes have been engulfed in flames, causing over 1,000 homes to be evacuated. In April, crews also managed to improve containment on the Star Avenue fire, but by Wednesday, the blaze had burned 197 acres. Friday, April 8th, also the headlines of CBSnews.com read, series of wildfires burns, burns more than 34,000 acres across the Florida panhandle. It is not a matter of if, but when we have significant damage and loss of fi life from fires in our county. We have a wonderful system of yard debris removal in our county through Waste Pro. It's inexpensive. They pick up yard debris every week. If you need larger tree removal, you just call them and they come and pick it up. But keep in mind, some people in this county are not participating in trash pickup as it is not mandatory. This leads to people burning household trash, which is illegal. However, someone has to report it and this puts neighbors at odds. Burning household garbage has an awful smell and will fill a neighbor's yard with smoke. I know because my neighbor has been doing it. When the fire department is called, they tell us to close all our windows and turn off your air conditioner, which will pull the smoke into your house. If it is summertime, this means no air conditioning for days because people will let the fire burn or smolder for days. Many people are not burning according to the regulations the Florida Department of Environmental Protection has on their website that a homeowner's fire must be 300 feet from another homeowner's dwelling. This is not happening. Perhaps a remedy is for the county to bill every dwelling on their tax bill for sanitary removal of household garbage and show this as a line item, just as we do for the public schools and county fire. It is very easy to pour diesel and gasoline on a pile of debris and burn. Um, please keep in mind that air pollution is the second leading cause of lung cancer, and according to the American Cancer Society, lung cancer is the second most common cancer, not counting skin cancer. Lung cancer is by far the leading cause of cancer death. Each year more people die of lung cancer than of colon, breast, and prostate cancers combined. So I um, saw on the agenda the, some of the items associated with this. Um, somehow I can't help but think that our lungs are more important than some of the other recent expenditures, some exceeding $15 million. Perhaps a federal grant from the EPA is available to help defray the cost of monitoring our air quality and enacting some measures so that we too may be one of those counties that can ban open burning which is causing the smoke. I've been in the health professions all my adult life. Leon County passed a mask mandate to protect our lungs from COVID, it is time we pass an ordinance or lobby the state's Department of Agriculture to change the laws to help protect all Floridians' lungs. I thank you for your attention. I have printed copies if you want it. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, you can give those copies to our recorder over there and she'll get them. Or you can actually start it with Commissioner Minor. Um, next speaker. Uh, final speaker, Kara Fleischer. I think we have them already. Kara, do you? <laughs> is, this, is this what you're passing on? Oh, okay, next time, next time. Yeah. All right, name and address for record, please, ma'am. Kara Fleischer, 24. Um, I don't remember my address anymore, it's so late. 4706 Inishir Court. Um, I'm a Leon Soil and Water Conservation District Supervisor and very familiar with the burning situation in our area. I worked with the city for two years. Um, when they were um, when we were talking about the burning ordinance um, that the city has and so what I wanted to bring to light today is what we are doing with the Leon Soil and Water Conservation District Supervisor to raise awareness about the air quality um, I'm passing this out and as you can see the picture on the front is a big huge prescribed fire because we are in a prescribed fire hotspot because we are surrounded by forests and the way we manage those forests is by prescribed burning them and any environmentalist will tell you that that's what has to happen so our areas are already um, surrounded with a lot of smoke and so this additional backyard burning is what we are trying to discourage um, by promoting this mulch it, don't burn it campaign. So that is something that we would love to see the county commission and the county sustainability office really embrace and help raise education because we found that if neighbors know better, they'll do better. And a lot of times this burning is totally unnecessary. 
Um, some things that we've done as a board is we put the air quality on Twitter every day, twice a day, so you can go check and see what the air quality is. And this is from the EPA fire and burn map. It goes directly from the fire and burn map to our Twitter account. Um, it is really important to know that when we walked in today, it was smoky outside and it was 130 something PM 2.5, which is red, code red. We had a code red today as we were walking in, which I thought was pretty ironic. Um, and so the thing is, though, schools don't know that, sports um, coaches don't know that, and so we've got kids out there playing um, baseball, running track in these days that have very high PM 2.5 particulates, which is very bad for health, especially for kids and the elderly. And Ms. Maisha, Maisha um, Mitchell has contacted me. We work together because the federal government has flagged um, the areas in Tallahassee 32304 and other um, underserved neighborhoods as being an environmental hotspot because of our air quality problems. So this isn't going away and this is really affecting our community. Um, so what we need is more sensors. We need sensors to be able to um, see what the air quality is in micro um, community areas. So that means like every mile and um, we are actively putting these purple air sensors in different areas all over town and we would really love to work with the commission on doing that these are low quality low low price good quality sensors they're only $250 and we have some already around town but we need more we need a lot more um, the reason why is because if you have a backyard burn in one community in one neighborhood that neighborhood's covered in smoke but the sensors are not picking it up if they're three miles away, and especially not if they're the EPA monitor way down at TCC. So it really is about getting those monitors out there. So I just wanted to encourage you all to um, look at the pr presentation I sent you. I go to different groups and present about air quality. And what's really interesting is the EPA has a lot of tools for us already. They have these great flag kits. So on red days, we can fly these red flags so the community knows. And they're doing this at schools all over the country because they have smog problems. We don't have car exhaust problems. We have burning problems. It's prescribed burning, and it's also backyard burning. So I would encourage you all to um, work with us at the Leon Soil and Water District. Let us um, you know, share what we've already done and figure out how we can expand that to raise education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Any more speakers, Mr. Administrator? No, that concludes our speakers. Thank you, Commissioners. It's about 30 minutes after. I would like to be done with this in about 10 minutes. Uh, Commissioner Minor, followed by any other speakers? Commissioner Minor. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I, I know this board and the county attorney have been working on this for well over a year. Uh, and it's been, it's been frustrating because We've got citizens in the county that have come to us that uh, are, are really uh, suffering. Um, and um, it, it's not hundreds. It's probably dozens. Wait, Commissioner Minor, do you have a motion for me? Uh, I'm getting, I'm leading up to it. I need to explain my motion. Option one. I move for option one, option two, and then there are a couple of amendments to that. Thank you. Option one and option two has been moved <clears throat> with a couple of amendments. You want to mention those amendments? With a couple of additions to it. You want to mention those? What's that? You want to mention those amendments? I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Option one, option two, go ahead and mention your amendment. And I'm going to add a couple of things to it. Yes, sir. All right. Um, people have a, a right to, to have a recreational fire on their property. Um, what we found is that there are people in the county that um, are on the, on the receiving end of incessant burning, day after day, months on end. Uh, where a neighbor is, is either with a barrel or something else burning a fire uh, with the smoke that comes onto their property um, and endangering their health. And um, again, it's not hundreds of people probably, it's maybe some dozens of people uh, in, in situations where their health is being affected by, uh, by a neighbor. And there's nothing in, this, in the statutes nor in um, uh, state agency rules that gives these folks any kind of leverage. Um, as, as much as we've tried to explore and the county attorneys in her office have done a great job trying to figure out some way where we can add some balance to this, 
Uh, not infringing on recreational fires, but infringing, uh, but basically trying to, to give folks leverage when we have cases of that, of that nuisance burning, that nuisance smoke. Um, here's my motion. So I'd, uh, I'd like to move for option one and option two. But uh, after talking with the county attorney on this, what I'd also like to do is request that the county attorney uh, work with FDACs, the Florida Forest Service, and DEP, encourage them, work with them to update, consider updating the rules that exist in those state agencies so that we are able to give some leverage to folks that are on the receiving end of this nuisance burning. Uh, right now, I said, there's, there's nothing in the agency rules that helps citizens with this problem. In addition, I'd like to bring back an agenda item um, at a time that makes sense where we can then talk about what we can do to, to help increase awareness of, uh, of the effects of, of burning. And, and along the lines of what uh, Ms. Fleischer has talked about in terms of increasing public awareness of the EPA air quality reports, exploring any ideas for purchasing more purple air monitors so we have a better assessment of um, the effects of uh, air quality around the county, county, and then also taking a look at what we can do to uh, join the Leon Soil and Water Conservation District on promoting their mulch it, don't burn it uh, campaign. So that's my motion. Um, I, it's frustrating that we actually can't go in and, and have a more strict ordinance that gives folks that are uh, undergoing this problem um, more, uh, more ability to you know, be able to simply go out in their yard and enjoy their backyard. But we were preempted by the state, as the county attorney has said, um, and uh, if we were to have some type of more strict ordinance, we would have to go through a, a very large effort, which would take as long as three years, hiring four FTEs, uh, that can provide that 24/7 response to, uh, um, to, to to complaints, which is which is what the floor of Forest Service already does. So that's my motion. Um, Option one, two is my move uh, with amendments to have the county attorney work with uh, various partners to see if we can movement on us being able to have a little more leverage in ordinance creation, uh, as well as a agenda item to come back looking at how we can better inform our community about uh, smoking its effects and burning its, its effects. Is that correct, Mr. Meyer? Yes, in, in the ways that I described. And anything else that the, uh, the county staff might deem uh, pertinent to it. Is there a second to that motion? A second. Seconded by Commissioner Dozier. Commissioner Dozier, out of the floor. Thank you. Um, good motion. Thank you. This has been a really challenging issue. I appreciate the county attorney's office for looking into it deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, it, it's it's tricky um, because people can't have backyard fires. I mean, we, we live in one of those areas. But trash burning, other things, I mean, there, there is the nu nuisance burning that affects people's health. So I think approaching DEP, others about that, finding a different solution because we, we don't have another option. Um, the only other comment I was going to make, Mr. Vice Chair and Commissioner Munner, thank you for summing that up and for the good information and for all of you hanging with us today. Um, if we were to explore some type of program, I think, uh, Carl, you make a really good point about sports teams and kids act, you know, the schools being aware of and other sports teams being aware of what the air quality is. I noted the smoke when I came in today and I also thought it was interesting timing. Um, so I would hope that we would look for options to partner with the schools, with the city, with others, the universities. Um, I don't think this is solely a county issue when it gets into that public education or monitoring. Um, we could look for the information to come back, but I would hope we would talk with them about uh, how to move forward. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Commissioner Cummings. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Vice uh, Chair. Um, I support um, Commissioner a minor's motion because there is a, a problem, especially out in the out in the county. Uh, but I understand that <clears throat> we have delegated authority to the Far Florida Forest Service and Department of Environmental Protection as far as uh, the burn ordinance is, is concerned. Am I correct, Madam? Uh, Madam Attorney. No, the reason I'm requesting the ordinance to repeal the existing ordinance is the existing ordinance says we've delegated, but in fact, that's not reality. We've been preempted. So 
that's why we need to just repeal the ordinance because it, it's it's incorrect. Okay, thank thank you so much. So, the sole authority pursuant to Florida statute is on the state level and not on the local level. If we were to try to establish a local program that would involve just the establishment part, over half a million dollars, we would have to have the program in operation for at least three years for to get sanctioned from the state as an operational program, I believe based on the analysis that we received. So um, we do, we really have a problem. We have citizens that have, uh, you know, called us about the burning issues with neighbors and I was happy to see uh, Mrs. Reese, uh, Ms. Roy Reese tonight speak to the issue. So, and we had the opportunity to go out and, and visit with her and some ride through the neighborhood and visit some of, some of the, uh, the area. So we recognize that it is a problem. So I do believe the responsible thing to do is to look further into it, uh, Commissioner Minor. And I certainly uh, support his, his motion. Thank you, Commissioner Proctor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to ask County Attorney, um, could you clarify your uh, response about the pre <coughs> preemption thingy? What were you speaking to? So under the current statutory framework, hmm? open burning is regulated by the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. <coughs> DEP has its own jurisdiction that it can also delegate. If we were to get a delegation from the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, all we could do is adopt the current standards. We couldn't actually impose anything more stringent, and it would really just be assuming responsibility for the regulation and enforcement. What this agenda item talks about is the other option, which is trying to obtain a delegation from the Department of Environmental Protection uh, under their statute a local air pollution control program. Under that model, we could adopt stricter standards ultimately if they approve a plan, um, but there, it's just a trade-off in terms of the fiscal impact to the county because of the resources it would take to assume responsibility for the regulata regulation and enforcement of that program. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, you all heard um, a very... Um a comprehensive um, presentation by the county attorney on that preemption thingy. And she states exactly, this is just one category of points that the chairman made previously tonight. Uh, it does not uh, elude my concepting the state of Florida actually preempting or taking away from us certain uh, home rule regulatory powers with respect to future development, in particular in the capital of Florida, in the capital city of Florida and county of Florida. When we talk about state exemption, there has been state uh, creep, uh, if you will, the creeping of the state's expanding tentacles and uh, the erosion of our home rule authority, again, is exemplified in the crystal clear presentation of what we have lost in, in establishing standards about fire safety. I appreciate that. It's the um, Exhibit A uh, for what previously I was talking about earlier, Commissioner Cummings. So please, we, we must always know the state is uh, forever reducing, diminishing our power. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Option one and two as amended by Commissioner Minor has been made. Seconded by Commissioner Dozier. All those in favor of the motion will communicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, commissioners will go now to item nine. How many, how many speakers do we have on 25? We have two speakers on item 25. All right. We'll go to item 25. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, commissioners, this item provides the board with an updated analysis on the efforts to preserve the Lake Hall Schoolhouse. As you'll recall, commissioners, um, you've received previous agenda items on this topic. Uh, the school board is located on uh, two privately owned parcels, and the county uh, has a long history in, in trying to do what we can to support citizen-led efforts to acquire uh, and preserve this structure. 
During your February 8th meeting, commissioners, the board received a status report on the schoolhouse, which indicated uh, that the property owners uh, have been unwilling to sell their portions of their property at a fair market value. It went into uh, some of the, um, the challenges and opportunities involved uh, with uh, the county utilizing uh, eminent domain uh, for, uh, to acquire the property. In addition uh, to the ownership issues, the report also summarized uh, the challenges of preserving the schoolhouse, uh, including uh, a lack of access to the site uh, through the surrounding neighborhoods and a lack of funding or management commitments uh, from the state uh, or other partners at this time. Uh, the board tabled uh, the issue at that time and took no further action. However, subsequently, uh, the board, uh, at your last meeting in March, uh, requested an updated analysis uh, that is presented in the item before you uh, now, including an estimates of costs and the processes associated with acquiring, restoring, and operating uh, the schoolhouse as a historic exhibit. Uh, the item also uh, includes a discussion of the process and requirements uh, of acquiring the schoolhouse via eminent domain. Uh, commissioners, uh, as discussed in the in detail in the item, Florida law requires that any private property acquired through eminent domain must be made available to the public. Uh, as a result, the county could not uh, acquire only the property in the immediate vicinity of the uh, of the schoolhouse uh, without taking additional actions uh, to uh, make the schoolhouse uh, suitable for public use. In other words, uh, the Lake Hall schoolhouse. Um, if it were acquired uh, through eminent domain, uh, additional site improvements would also be needed uh, to make uh, uh, and made uh, in order to make the uh, facility available to the public. Um, as you'll see, commissioners, in the item, the cost to acquire uh, the property and to make the school and to make those improvements would be uh, approximately $3.1 million, uh, which would include restoring the, the house itself, uh, building a parking area, uh, uh, minimum restroom, stormwater fencing, and those types of improvements. Uh, and that estimate would be uh, for a minimal project scope uh, just to acquire the school and one additional parcel uh, to the east uh, on Thomasville Road. As you recall, Commissioners, uh, Dr. Jerry C. Uh, has proposed a broader conceptual plan to create uh, a Lake Hall School State Park, um, uh, which uh, was presented uh, to the board during uh, the comment period at your last meeting, Dr. C's proposal would involve uh, additional parcels and infrastructure for a total cost of $4.5 million uh, is our latest estimate. Uh, there are uh, no funding sources currently identified for these costs. There are no uh, other funding or management commitments uh, in place at this time uh, uh, for, from other partners. So in summary, uh, commissioners, um, uh, there is no viable option uh, to restore the Lake Hall Schoolhouse as a historical exhibit at this time, uh, given everything that we've provided to you uh, in the analysis. Uh, historical preservation efforts like this typically involve technical assistance and coordination with state historical preservation offices, uh, funding commitments from in-state grants uh, and other sources, uh, and willing sellers, uh, importantly. Uh, none of those are uh, at, in place at this time. As I've mentioned, the county... Uh, has been supportive uh, of, of several uh, efforts over the years by Dr. C uh, and the Riley House to, pres uh, to preserve the Lake Hall Schoolhouse, and I expect that we would continue to be supportive uh, if any opportunities arise in the future. With that, Mr. Chairman, uh, this option recommends option one, and we're happy to answer any questions you might have. As I mentioned, we have two speakers. Speakers, please, Mr. Chair. I mean, I'm sorry, Mr. Vermeister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, the first speaker, Dr. Jerry C. Uh, yeah. Yep. Not to see your first speaker unless you don't want to go first. I've got him. Okay. Hi, I'm sorry, guys. I forgot everything, but not really. Um, my name's Nita Davis, once again. 1111 East Paul Russell Road, Tallahassee, Florida, 32301. I have been with this project for quite a while, for quite a few years. As a matter of fact, the Department of State said I would find a chicken coop if I found anything, but instead I found a school. And um, I think I've said before, that school's been waiting there a long time, and it's still waiting, but it's, it's not going to stand forever. Its days are numbered. And, you know, you came up, these, these numbers you came up with, well, Mr. Proctor, I don't know if you remember, but back in 1997, I stood up in front of you, about Litchgate on High Road, and you pulled in 
and got some reserve seed money for Litchgate on High Road, and you helped us save that. And I sold, I sold my dad's Marine Corps uniforms from World War II to help pay that mortgage. But we saved it. And we have people from all over the world coming to see that place. And we have a dirt parking lot, the Junior Museum. You know, you're talking about how much this parking lot's going to cost? Well, look at that Junior Museum. They don't have a concrete parking lot. Litchgate people come from all over. We have one little driveway. We have a dirt parking lot. And for you guys to sit here and come up with these big numbers and say, can't do it, but yet you can intimate domain all those people over there on FAMU Way because it wasn't aesthetically pleasing to have that neighborhood there and drive down that road and for a holding pond when there was absolutely alternatives to that holding pond. It wasn't about that holding pond, and you know it wasn't. And it's just like that school. You can come up with all these numbers to, to not do it, but that's all that is. You don't have the heart. I'm looking at each one of you. Either you have the heart to do this and make it work, or you don't. And if you intimate domain those people, a whole neighborhood, but you can't save a school that was built by men that were slaves in 1870 for their children, children that never went to school, if you don't have the heart to do that, shame on our city. This is the oldest one-room African-American schoolhouse in the state of Florida, and you're telling me you can't do it? I don't buy that. I don't buy that. You, you can hide behind all your legalese and all your staff reports, but that's all you're doing. You're not putting your heart out there. Thank you, ma'am. Next speaker. Next speaker, Dr. Jerry C. Max X. X. Sorry, it's late. Max, name that just for record, yes. please, sir. Hi, all. Max Epstein, 1001 San Luis Road. Um, I gave you a little handout here, and our major ask today is this property has been on the market for 60 days, and the owner has refused offers because they have been waiting and wanting to work with Leon County. This is the property that will allow ingress to the um, school. As you can see, there's already a driveway. Perhaps that would have to be uh, repaved and a, a little area in the back that leads directly back to the school. Okay, And this is for sale. The school property was also for sale um, last time around. The owner has expressed a willingness to sell. And we have found out, you know, the county took $800,000 to preserve the Miccosukee School. We've been working on this for two years. The Miccosukee School, the, the Concord School, was originally an African-American school. It's at the um, Tallahassee Museum right now. We were able to get a $1 million grant for that school. So where's the beef? Okay. I mean, the last time we were here, everyone talked about how important it was to save this. How incredibly important. Uh, does that mean you don't want to spend the money to do it? Um, I'd like to know where the money comes from. I appreciate the staff analysis, but that's kind of like the 50,000 foot we we're talking about, right? We need this piece, and we also need the piece that the school sits on, and there were two willing sellers for this. Um, so I would like the county to direct the, you know, the administrator to please initiate negotiations with both of those people, bring it back to the next um, commission meeting so you know what the hard numbers are. Do we need a stormwater pond here? I don't think so. You can put a dirt parking lot here. How much is it actually going to cost? This house turns into your um, research archives. It turns into the welcome. It's already a bathroom in there. Put a second ADA bathroom in there. And there are grants galore. The city got $750,000 for Ashmore's using the grant that I developed. Okay, We have a Florida Forever Boundary application complete and already vetted. We just need the owner's permission. It can be a letter, a letter saying we will sell this property or the ownership from the county. 
So I would really appreciate, and you look right here, I'll, I'll finish up quickly. These are the two pieces that we need. But this piece on Thomasville is going to go away. And y'all please need to see what you can buy it for and see what the cost would be to buy both of those pieces. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Next speaker. Uh, Delandre Hollinger. Good evening. <clears throat> Delatry Hollinger, uh, 501 Alpha Avenue. Uh, commissioner Proctor, I think you were the only sitting commissioner who was on the board when Mrs. Barnes uh, worked very, very hard to restore and to move Lake Hall School. Um, at the time, she wanted it for the Riley House's Visitor Center. Uh, that was 2006, if I recall. Um, that did not happen. When we talk about funding sources and grants uh, and the fact that none are in place, in order to secure grants for historic preservation, most times the property either has to be owned by a local government or by a nonprofit organization. And if it's owned by private property owners, many of the grants that are available are not going to come through. Um, a lot of work has been done by the many stakeholders and dynamic leadership in our community in reference to the Lake Hall School. Uh, which is the oldest remaining African-American schoolhouse in the state of Florida. I certainly disagree with the recommended action um, that is before you on this evening, and I implore the board to take into strong consideration how we could be a leader on issues of this magnitude in our state, especially considering the legislative climate in which we find ourselves. Again, we are speaking about the oldest African-American Rosenwald schoolhouse that is still left standing in the state of Florida. I've also had the opportunity to review the analysis and conclude that the estimated costs for initiating an eminent domain action, restoration, public access, and other associated costs are far less than many of the other projects that our blueprint intergovernmental agency has subsidized recently. It is far less than the six and a half million dollar commitments that our CRA board has made to the most impoverished areas of our city. It is far less than the county's annual operating budget and it is far less than the two hundred million dollars in infrastructural investment that has been promised by Blueprint on the south side. And the estimated annual operational costs of one hundred and twenty thousand dollars or a historic state park which would have a statewide positive impact and formally establish this site as a tourist destination pales in comparison to other annual activities that we fund consistently without fail each year. Commissioners, the worst thing that we could do on tonight is take no action on this item. This would be a surefire way to effectively kill this project when we could take this golden opportunity to do something that no other county in our state has done and preserve Florida's oldest remaining historical African-American schoolhouse. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Next speaker. Next speaker is Dr. Jerry C. Dr. C, name and address for record, please, ma'am. I think the important thing I want to say here is that uh, putting this project together requires patience and time. Nothing is going to happen all at the same time. I've divided it into three phases, and I was asking your help for the first phase. First phase is to acquire the property that's on Thomasville Road so that we can have access to the school. The second part of phase one is to acquire the school only on its own land. I've already given you the surveys. You probably had that in your document somewhere. 1870, I'm sure it's hard to imagine, five years after the Civil War, a group of people buying their own land, their own homes, their own farms, and in five years they decided their children needed a school. And that's what we're looking at. We're looking at a group of people who found agency when they shouldn't have been able to, and they had the uh, sense of purpose to know that education was going to be the cornerstone of what would turn their children into American citizens who could thrive and take care of themselves. So here we are then, entrusted with really a national treasure. 
not just Leon County, not just Florida, a national treasure that people will come from everywhere to see because this does not exist in other places, is what you need to understand. It doesn't exist. It's on its own land, and every remnant of that building is original to that site. So the people who will come will be archaeologists, historians, educators, all kinds of people will be drawn to Tallahassee. You want to be a tourist spot, you're going to have to have something for people to come here for. And that's what this is. So I'm hoping that you'll be able to tell me, if eminent domain won't work, what will? What can you do? Can you help us acquire the, the, the house so we can get access? And no, there aren't any grants in place, Mr. Long, because you can't write a grant unless you own the property. So to say that there aren't any grants in place is kind of disingenuous because I can't write a grant unless I own the property or you own the property. I just missed an opportunity for a million dollars with the African American Culture and Historic Grant that our president sent down. That would have been perfect. So here I am then asking you for the, I don't even know how many times I've been here, but I'm looking for you to tell me, what can you do? If you can't do these things I've already said, you can't do eminent domain, you can't manage it, you can't give us any, what can you do? It's on your watch. And it won't be there too much longer. So I'm looking now for you to tell me, what can you do? Here's what I need. I need the house. I need the access to the school. I need those two people to agree to sell, which they have. And I need you all to help negotiate that along with the other partners who have been able to help me so far. And I want to thank these folks for staying this long. They didn't have to stay. Thank you, Dr. C. Commissioner's discussion. Is there a motion? Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Uh, Vice Chair. Um, I want to thank uh, the speakers that came up and spoke on this particular item. Um, thank also staff for the detailed analysis. But I'm certainly in favor of preserving this particular structure as the oldest one-room African-American um, school that was built in, in 1870. And I'm wondering, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, if we can look at this from the standpoint of different phases. I recognize that the report that we have from staff looks at, in my opinion, from the beginning, to the end, the acquisition, eminent domain of quite a few parcels. And I would like us to look at this in stages uh, rather than looking at a, acquiring or getting the right away from several, from seven different parcels. If we could look at, if we would be willing to look at acquiring the perimeters of the property and what's necessary uh, for parking. And if Mr. Epstein is correct, this item 25 he has given us, he's represented, and I don't know, I haven't been out there, I've been trying to get out there, but I haven't, uh, that this particular property owner is willing to sell in his, his position, his, his um, representation to us that this would provide access to that, uh, to the Lake Hall schoolhouse. Uh, so if that's the case, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, I think it's incumbent upon us as county commissioners to preserve this, um, this particular structure if we can, any way we can, and look at it not so much from the three or four million dollars that that we have before us, and, and I'm sure that covers years, because eminent domain can be a, a long process, and even after the judge issues an order of taking and you have the property, litigation can continue uh, if there's a dispute. 
you know, about the value of the property and, and, and different things. But what I would like to see us do is look at a couple of things initially, and I would call it, like Dr. C indicated, phase one. Phase one would be let, let's see what we can do to acquire the perimeters of the property and what's necessary from a code standpoint for parking. And if this property is up for sale and if it would provide the ingress and egress that's, that's required, then why not delve into it and explore it and see if that would be the first step to preservation? And I don't think it would be a $3 million uh, price tag to do that initially. Um, I, I know the proposal is to have this structure in the surrounding area as a park. And that might be something that we could uh, realize some years down the road. Uh, once it's acquired, I think there would be grants that could be applied for. Uh, other a financial support. Uh, but right now, I think we need to take baby steps. And I think the first baby step would be if we could just look at the at acquisition and look at access um, to, to the property. And then take the next step um, with hopefully funding from, from other entities, including the county. Uh, but that's my position, Mr. Mr. Vice Chair. I, I just I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Do you want to make that in the form of a motion, or you just want that just discussion? I'm sorry. I didn't you want to make that in the form of a motion? Is that discussion? Well, I, I'm willing to make the motion, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, that we. My motion is that we, as a commission, look at acquisition of this property in a bifurcated manner with the first phase being looking at acquiring the property and looking at item 25, if in fact it will allow ingress and egress to the property and ask staff if they can look into it mm -hmm. and bring some information back. Is that proper? So bring, it looks bring like- Bring an agenda item back yeah. on, on that specifically. Yeah, Commissioner Cummings, it sounds like what you're saying is, is similar to what I heard earlier. You're giving the uh, county administrator the, the ability to negotiate with the property owners of those two parcels to see what the price would be coming back for those two pieces that would give the ingress, in, egress, and the, the property specifically for the school as phase one. And then once that comes back, we have a discussion on that, and then we talk about the next phase. Is that correct? Is that your motion? Is there a second to that motion? Are you going to second the motion? Okay, clarification. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I think, number one, there's three parcels. You got that parcel plus the two parcels where the actual building lies. My question to the county attorney and, or the county administrator would be, and I'm inclined, as you all know, which is no secret to support this activity, but I want to make sure we're not just continually banging our head against the wall here, coming back and back and back with the same result. And so my question to the county administrator is, can the county engage in a real estate transaction hand-to-hand -hand for, a, for a residential property? If, let's say hypothetically, that we find out that that piece of property, they want $400,000 for that house. And then we find out that the two owners... Where the, where the schoolhouse sits want another collective $100,000. So now we got a $500,000 acquisition price, hypothetically. Then the county's got to go through and do the analysis for getting that property up to the code, up to for parking and stormwater and all that. Maybe that adds another $500,000. A million dollars sounds a lot better than $4.1 million, hypothetically, theoretically. <laughs> okay? So... My question is, does that hypothetical mesh with county ability? In, in short, Mr. County Administrator, could you manifest that hypothetical? Knowing we, don't, we have not budgeted money for this, we do not foresee having that money right away, but a million dollars seems much more reasonable than $4.1 million. I didn't know about this property. 
I know exactly where this property is. However, the one that we are finding out tonight from Mr. Epstein is for sale. Could we make a motion or could, again, this is hypothetical, okay, because I don't want to put you guys in a tough spot. Can we make a motion just to direct staff to investigate? And I know this is like the fifth analysis on this that just I've been involved in. Can we direct staff to investigate the cost of that property and those adjacent properties where the house is to just acquire them, forget eminent domain, acquire them as county property if they are available for sale, then the county can facilitate at that point working with interested stakeholders like Dr. C and community members to access grant monies and things like that to facilitate the project. Mr. Administrator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just first say, Commissioners, and you know from receiving our analysis, our analysis, if there was an easy route to this, we would have already presented it to you. Uh, we've presented the analysis, as you've said, several different times, and we've broken it out in ways where we've, we've taken the various parcels and all of the different things, and we've provided costs associated with them. For us to go investigate and, and, and determine what they would be willing to sell for is a little bit, we've already done it in the analysis. We provided estimates of what we believe we could acquire the parcels for, either through eminent domain or through the fair market value. So that's contemplated in our, our analysis already. Um, so again, the, you know, now could we come back to you and say that the, the, the uh, property owners are unwilling to, to sell? We, we could say that, but for the purposes of, of knowing what the cost would be and that sort of thing, we've, we've got those included in the analysis. But again, if, if, the, again, if, if what you were looking for was for us to, to verify, and I'll look over here and I'll just check on, on the latest with, with Alan and, and Andy and others in terms of the, the most current status of, of the property owners and their willingness to sell or not sell, we could certainly do that. But as you know, we've, we've been engaged um, with this a while, and we know the numbers. We've got some pretty good estimates of what we believe uh, it would cost, even if they were willing to sell. Uh, any, any updates on the, uh, on the property owners? What does that mean? Explain what that means. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioners, the analysis that's presented to you is the latest information that we have. We have nothing further from the property owners. I have no further information beyond that. Does that include the analysis of the property that, that Mr. Epstein brought up? Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Does that include the property Mr. Epstein talked about? That's correct, Commissioners. The parcel to the east of Lake Hall Schoolhouse is currently listed for sale for $425,000. And as Vince mentioned, then there's the, the, the issue of the, the um, uh, two portions of the properties on which the schoolhouse is located. And then the other piece that he talked about, that, that, that's also listed for sale? The parcel on Thomas Hill Road is listed for sale currently. Right. He talked right. about another piece as well. I guess that was one piece. So that one piece is 425, what you're saying? Correct. All right. Thank you. Um, so it is listed for sale, but it's 425. So for clarity, Andy, that house is listed for 425? Correct, on Thomasville Road. And as far as we know, the two people where the schoolhouse sits are willing to sell, as far as we know. And you know the price. At least as it, I know it's fluctuating, which is unfortunate. But I mean, 425 plus whatever they're wanting for those little tiny carve-outs, I understand what staff is saying, but it doesn't add up to $4 million. I get with roads and access and acquiring all the other parcels around that, but the question that we need to answer for these folks so that we can quit butting our heads against the wall here is, can we just acquire that $425,000 house and the carve-outs for the actual schoolhouse, which has got to be less than $500,000, $600,000 total, then you're into this thing for way less than $4 million. Then you have a situation where you can access grant money with stakeholders in the community. I understand what you're saying, Mr. County Administrator and Madam County Attorney. I, I get the, the barriers and the boundaries that we're trying to operate in here, but I, I want us to try and be creative and not be, um, not be you know, too obtuse about it. What can we hypothetically facilitate this thing, which I think we all want to do? I think we all want to do it with just 
If we know that person's willing to sell their property for $425,000, then the question becomes, can we functionally as a county facilitate that hand-to-hand -hand transaction? Can we direct county staff to go talk to that homeowner and say, the county would like to engage you in a purchase of your property and then take that information, if we can get a contract, and then go to the people that have the schoolhouse and go, we want to engage you in a contract for your share of the schoolhouse. I know we can do a variance to carve it all back into one piece of property. If it, my understanding is that's, that would be a contiguous property with an act with a driveway. Obviously, there'd have to be more investment in it, but from Commissioner Cummings's point of segmenting it, kind of stepping it along the way, that seems like a pretty rational and reasonable step in the direction we'd like to go. The question becomes, can we do that? I would, I'm inclined to make a motion to do that, but I want to make sure I'm not crossing you up to the point that you can't, that I put you in a tight spot. Mr. Uh, Commissioner Welsh, the, the, the motion's already been made. I'm, it's kind of waiting for a second, but. Well, I need to, I mean, very, very clearly, as, as clearly as you can, can you answer Commissioner Welsh's question with a yes or a no? So in terms of the legal aspects of this, if you're not exercising eminent domain, then that's something completely different. If the if you have a willing seller of the property on Thomasville Road, you know what that costs. It's my understanding, and I don't know the current status of this, but that the one property owner where the majority of the schoolhouse sits at one point was willing to carve out and sell that portion. Uh, I don't know the amount for that. It was my understanding the other property owner was not willing to sell that portion that the schoolhouse sits on because it sits so close to their house that they've built on that property. That may or may not have changed. But if you have willing sellers on those two parcels where the schoolhouse straddles, and they want more than fair market value, that is not something staff could do unilaterally under real estate policy. They would bring that back to you for consideration. Mm -hmm. That is the legal landscape that you're looking at. That is my question. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I want to support Commissioner Cummings' motion, but can we reshape your motion, Commissioner Cummings, to sort of capture that reality that it may not work the way we're, we're thinking it's going to work, right? So. I would say, if you would allow me the indulgence, uh, Madam County Commissioner, to say we direct staff in this motion, or so this be an amended amendment, we direct staff to investigate the cost of that property in a hand-to-hand -hand transaction at a market, fair market value, and also speak directly, Not no more eminent domain, now we're talking to just acquiring the properties through traditional means as a county government, ask those individuals where the property sits, it's where the house sits itself, to give us a, a fair, tell them can't pay more than fair market value, so you can't, you know, extort more money out of than you than you normally would. Can we make that? I, I will second that motion, Commissioner Cummings. If we make it that way, that puts staff in a posture where they can be successful, come back and say we offered fair market value, and these folks didn't want fair market value; they wanted more than that, or they wanted something else, or this or that. I would accept that friendly amendment. All right, the amendment has been accepted. We have a motion and a second. The motion is that we go to the property owners to ask them if they will accept fair market value for the pieces uh, that straddle the uh, schoolhouse as well as the piece of land uh, that's now on the market for 425, which I'm thinking 425 is probably not fair market. But um, that motion is on the floor. Is there any more discussion on that motion? Yes, I have Commissioner Minor and I have Commissioner Dozier. Mr. Vice Chair, just a quick point of clarification, because we haven't been using the parcel numbers that are in the project map in the agenda item. So your motion, uh, Commissioner Cummings, acted by Commissioner Welch, is to uh, basically investigate um, parcels two and three, which are the two small parcels on which the Lake Schoolhouse sits. Along with the parcel for exactly, the which is on, which is for sale listed at four hundred twenty-five thousand. Yes, sir. So we're looking at parcel yep. one, two. parcel two, and parcel three. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. So, so really, what we're looking at there is is one. But, Mr. Administrator, do you do you guys already have an estimate of the fair market value? Yes. Okay. Yes, and that is the item. Yes, yeah. and the it, item. again, there's been, been a lot of conversation, commissioners, too, about you know what. We could do in phases, and certainly we could do a lot of things, and we can bring that back to the board. But just, and I think you all know this, it's absolutely incumbent on us to provide you 
what we believe the cost will be to acquire this, including access, and what the minimal cost would be to make it available to the public. Mm-hmm. We can make a lot of assumptions on a lot of different things about grants and different things like this, but these are the minimal costs, and that's our role. That's what we – it's a very important that that's incumbent on us Thank you. that we provide that to you in the analysis. Thank you. Commissioner Dozier? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is this is a really difficult issue because, um, well, quite frankly, it makes me reflect on our ongoing discussions about hiring a staff person in conjunction with the city to work on cultural and archaeological resources. Mm-hmm. Um, city didn't walk with us on that. I, I hope you know we get there in the future, but. It is an effort to never be in this position again. We never need to develop a neighborhood around a resource like this, say a historic, I mean, just just such an amazing part of our history, oldest in the state, that we should be able to protect. Once it is locked in with private property, it gets more and more challenging. So I just I needed to put that out there because I do appreciate this board's, you know, digging into that issue because we're trying to prevent these types of things from happening again and add resources. Um, I'm I'm a fan of getting creative. I mean, this, like you said, Commissioner Cummings, there's a lot of property listed in this, and um, and there were other concerns that I'm sure you all have talked that the county attorney brought up in our briefing about using eminent domain, correct me if I'm wrong, ma'am, but that some grants, if we were to use eminent domain, we, whether it's a nonprofit or the county may be prevented from accessing some grants um, because they need a willing seller. Is that correct? Did I remember that language correctly? That's correct. Okay. And that included Florida Forever? Is that? I may, I may have had that wrong, but I thought... That included the Florida Communities Trust Program. The, I'm sorry. The Florida Communities Trust Program. Okay. But not the Florida Forever Program. It, thank you, ma'am. It, I thought that was in the item that Florida Forever, they try to get willing sellers. I wasn't sure if that was requirement for the grant. Yeah. Okay. So, I, I came into today hoping that we would have had a creative solution, and maybe we will stumble onto that. But the fact that using eminent domain, which requires a public purpose and may prevent us from getting some grants, well, I'm looking at a scenario where the county may be on the hook for improving the property and using it for that public purpose. Now. I mean, there, there's value in that, to be sure. I take some issue with comparing it with Concord School and others. I mean, certainly the original is at Tallahassee Museum, but the existing in Miccosukee, that's where I went to school, and it's been used by Boys and Girls Club, and, I mean, it's a valuable asset in that community. So, I mean, these are apples and oranges, in my opinion. So we need to focus on this particular project. So I was concerned about the eminent domain. If there were a way to acquire the parcels that are part of this motion, just the one fronting on Thomas Hill Road and the schoolhouse itself. Is that enough um, in both items, You, in particularly the last one, Mr. County Administrator, but you and the county attorney have, have really gone to lengths to explain how much we need to do to be able to open it to the public. I, I understand, you know, maybe some people think it wouldn't need a stormwater pond, but their land use... Um, or there's development rules that we have to follow. We impose them on others and we have to follow. So would that one parcel and the schoolhouse be enough to get started to apply for grants and to meet that public access requirement? You may not know that at this point, but... um... We wouldn't know it at this point. We'd have to do some more research on it, and we'd have to... Again, ours is to present you sort of the big pictures. There's a lot of things that could happen with result as a result of this, but again, uh, we can't take any of that to the bank. And and by the way, we've we've done a lot of this before. Yeah. Yeah. This isn't the first time we've done this. Right, see, okay. uh, I appreciate 
the fact that you want to speak and you're excited about it, but it's it's ten twenty and I cannot concentrate on too many voices at one time. Commissioner Dozier, finish your comments. Thank you, sir. Um, I am with you all. I would like to find a way to get this done. But we have so many needs in this community. This is one incredible need, to be sure. But if Leon County is left with property on Thomasville Road and with a historic structure that needs improvement and we cannot make meet those requirements with that limited amount of property or we can't get the grants, that gives me pause. We are sitting on other property and not necessarily the county. There is other property out there that city and county have acquired a lot. Okay, I'm going to take the county out of that. I'm really thinking about city property. Forgive me, Ms. County Administrator. I don't want to toss you in there. I'm thinking of the you know, shelter property, other things. We need to activate the property that we have. Those are apples and oranges as well. But this is my concern. So if there was one more step that we could take to look at whether or not this limited amount of property um, could get there, I'm willing to go with you on that. But I'm just, I need to ask those questions because based on what we have heard from our staff the last two rounds and where they've dug into the history, it may be very challenging to activate it with that limited amount of property. So that's my concern. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Ms. Vice Chair. Thank you, Commission. Dr. C would like to make another comment. I'll leave it up to the Commission's discretion. Okay, Dr. C, give me a second. I'll leave it up to the Commission's discretion on whether or not I allow that comment. Is the Commission okay with me allowing that comment? Dr. C. Yes, I'm sorry, just make sure you understood the Dr. C, after your comment, just let you guys know there will be no more comment from the audience. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. I wanted to make sure you knew that uh, both the Lantre and I uh, manage and own historic property that we have had placed on the National Register. So we've restored our property. We know the process. And we both run uh, successful uh, enterprises in our buildings. We're both in Frenchtown. And we've recently been awarded grants from the African American Culture and Historic uh, Grant Cycle that just passed. Um, I'm looking for 500000 to do my project, which I couldn't do for the school because I didn't own it. And Delantre is coming up with 350000 So this is what we do. So I wouldn't say <laughs> that uh, we're novices to this. This is part of our lives, and when I say to you that we write grants and we generally get them, that's what we do. So this school is something, and this is just your first step to help us move forward. The bigger plan won't cost you anything, because that's not a part of what this deal is. The rest of the park stuff, Forever Florida, has $2 million that comes with it already written a grant and we've already talked to the people about what it is we need to do to move forward. But owning that property is one of the things that has to happen. So I did, I did want to reassure you that we pretty much know what we're doing and what we're trying to do is to make sure that we've done everything we can do along with the Litchgate folks and Max to do what we've done before with this school. Because to not do so is um, not only negligent but because of our experience, it's close to being sinful. We sit here and let that thing go. That's our burden to bear. And we're not willing to bear that burden because we know what we're doing and we're trying to help you see mm -hmm. that we know how to get it done. Thank you, Dr. C. Vice Chair, yes. if I may. Um, Please. Dr. C, I'm, we've had lots of conversations over the years. I very much regret the fact that we weren't able to talk before this meeting. Um, but to be clear, I'm not questioning the experience. I mean, I mean, you, you all have had a lot of experience on this. I'm not questioning that. 
each project, and you know this very well, is uniquely challenging, right? I'm just raising concerns because we got to respect that we've got a tremendous amount of needs in our community, and y'all know that as well as anybody. So that's, and we're doing our due diligence. That's what we have to do. As much as personally we would love to get it done, it's a hard thing to get done, or else we wouldn't have been talking about this since 2006. Mm. It's hard to get done. So I appreciate the efforts. Just wanted to say that, Mr. Ch Vice Chair, because everybody's working hard. Our staff has worked hard on this. There may be disagreements, but this is a hard thing to get done because we didn't protect it in the first place, and nobody on this dais is responsible for that, but we can try to do what we can at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Motion on the floor made by Commissioner Welch, seconded by Commissioner uh, Cummings to... Yeah. Motion on the floor made by Commissioner Cummings, seconded by Commissioner Welch, where we will look at giving the administrator the, and staff the ability to uh, offer for fair market value to the property owners that straddle the school and the property owner that would give ingress and egress to the school plus a parking lot. Um, that motion has uh, been made and seconded. All those in favor of the motion on the floor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay. Carry, motion carries out objection. All right, we'll go now to item number 26. Mr. Administrator, I'm going to do you the favor uh, and, and introduce the items for a full board appointment for the Leon County Research and Development Authority Board of Governors and adoption of a resolution modifying uh, nominating committee membership. We only have one person who is eligible to be appointed. Commissioner Dozier, you have the floor as our resident expert on LCRDA. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I did not say this earlier. Um, well, first, because you're going to ask me if I start talking, I will make a motion. Thank you. For a staff recommendation option. Staff recommendation has been moved by Commissioner Dozier. Is there a second? Uh, uh, seconded by uh, Commissioner Minor. I want you guys to know that Mr. Uh, Mr. Brian there has sat through this whole meeting just for this item. Raise your hand and wave to us. This man has sat through this whole meeting just to see that he could be appointed to answer any questions that we may have of him. So we can make good use of this time and ask him at least one question. Well, Brian, could you come up, please, sir? Give me your name and address for the record. Commissioner Dozier, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, well, you beat me to that because, yes, sitting here for the entire meeting, and I didn't even get to engage with, talk with you much before, I mean, just to say hi. So thank you for staying here, and um, we, we have talked. Thank you for your interest in the board. Um, so before we get to um, Brian's comments about his interests, if, if you don't mind, Mr. Vice Chair. On consent, we approved a line of credit from Florida State University um, that will, and forgive me, Brian, I just, I wanted to tee this up because I think it'll feed right into um, our hopes, you know, for you joining our board, and we're very excited about that. Um, this has been an eight-year project to get a um, multi-use high-tech incubator to retain companies in this community. Mm -hmm. We've never had anything like this before. I'm chairing the North Florida Innovation Labs Committee. We will break with our approval of the line of credit today. We have almost every single thing we need to break ground on this 40,000 square foot facility next month. Mm -hmm. It's a partnership with federal government, OEV, Innovation Park, and FSU came in at the end to make this work. Construction pro um, prices have gone up. But we hope we don't get to that line of credit because we're going to start fundraising and um, we've got some strong people on the board and staff, but I think, uh, I hate to put too much on your shoulders there, Brian, but I think new members of the board bringing new experience is really gonna help us out. So I wanted to tie those two issues together. Thank you, I am done. I will let you speak, sir, and look Brian, forward to serving. Brian, just a quick name and address for the record, please, sir, and just 30 seconds on your pleasure for serving. Yeah, Brian Batista, uh, 576 Roden Cove Road, Tallahassee, Florida. And uh, I don't. I don't need thirty seconds. It's uh, it's an honor to be considered, and I, I'd uh, uh, enjoy the opportunity. And, and thank you guys for your consideration. Thank you for your patience tonight and your willingness to serve, Commissioner Proctor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to lift up no nothing personal against Mr. Matisse at all, um, but as a matter of process, 
uh, that this particular board is allowed each member to uh, nominate its successor. Um, I was just pondering this. Um, I know that democracy is on life support, and it's a dying uh, model of, 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 of um, governance. But to the extent that it might uh, have a breath of life, um, how do interested citizens, um, um, you know, get to, to serve? They, it, it seems that they have to go through a private meeting with a, uh, a sitting board member um, in order, instead of coming through uh, a public uh, um, um, process. And I'm, I'm just concerned that the way that we've set out for the line of secession, this specific board, is that it goes through its own members. Uh, certainly, this becomes very uh, a club-like, uh, self-perpetuating thing that uh, it, it lacks that dynamic called public transparency. And um, I, I'm sure that this is in the, as I looked at the uh, something here, as you said, it's getting late. But I know I've seen um, that this board has been shown deference to self-nominate and appoint. Uh, county commissioners can't. Judges don't choose their own successors. President of the United States don't. But I understand the level of democracy. And I just wanted to point a concern out with that. And I think it could be strengthened if we would allow for the public to be able to come through uh, the formal and normal process with which we do other boards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Motion on the floor is for option. I'm very sorry. It needs to be stated for the record. This is handled very similar to our other boards. It's governed by statute. County administrator could lean into this, but I'll just take it really quick. Applications are submitted like they are for any of our boards. The other ones coming up, anybody can apply. And there has to be a committee by statute that looks at those applications. This was a kind of a midterm um, resignation from the board, and so it opened a seat. There'll be more in the future, and we would love to have more applicants. Absolutely. Thank so, you. But this functions like our other boards. Thank Close. you. Options one and two have been moved by Commissioner Dozier, <coughs> seconded by Commissioner Minor, I believe. Uh, yes. Uh, all those in favor of the motion on the floor came by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries without objection. We'll go to, now to item number 27. I would like to start with the tourist development piece because here again, we have had someone sit through every single item to be placed. Mr. Dawes, please, sir. Um, as he comes up, the next item is full board appointments to the Minority Women in Business, Small Business, uh, Minority Women in Small Business Enterprise Citizen Advisory Committee, the Tallahassee Sports, Account, Sports Council, and the Tourist Development Council. Item number 27, Mr. Dawes, go ahead and introduce yourself and name and address for the record. I'm Russell Dawes. I live at 2300 Orleans Drive, Tallahassee, Florida, 32310. Thanks, sir. Uh, oh, oh, 08. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, is your interest to serve on the Tourist Development Council, correct, sir? Correct. Is your interest to serve on the Tourist Development Council? I'm is sorry. Is your interest to serve on the Tourist Development Council? Yes? Yes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, could I ask him a question, please? Please. Just, yes. I mean, ev evidence suggests, are you related to Gene Deckerhoff? <laughs> is there a no. motion option for Mr. Dawes? Mr. Dawes has been moved by uh, Commissioner Dozier, seconded by Commissioner Welch. Any objection? Seeing none, correct. Congratulations, sir. Thank you for your service. Thank you very much. Uh, you, yes. Uh, I'll move option one for the two candidates listed. Option one has been moved by Commissioner Jackson, seconded by uh, Commissioner Cummings. Any objection? Seeing none, congratulations to those two. Option two, do you have any takers on that one? <laughs> yep. Yes, ma'am. I didn't see any other hands up. Um, reappoint uh, James Card. Okay. And I was going to, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll amend that. <laughs> yes, it's two citizen. Um, in this case, we've got, you know, a group of good ones. Um, I hope I pronounced her name right. I was thinking Ms. Um, Egloff is from Egloff. Tal yeah, Tallahassee okay. Orthopedic um, Clinic right. and um, might be a very good member Thank of you. that board. So and for option number two, yeah. um, Mr. Card and, and Ms. Egloff, 
Yes. Is the motion, is there a second? A second. Any objection? So it is approved unanimously. And now we will go finally to option three, appoint one citizen to the Tourist Development Council for the remainder of the unexpired term. Um, there are two eligible applicants. Do you have any takers on that one? Mr. Vice Chair, both these applicants look good. I'm not sure um, if anyone had. If there's no one, I mean, Mr. Vice Chair, are you taking a look at it? Go for it. I would, just picking one out of uh, thin air here, I was going to go for um, Caroline Savage. I really didn't pick it out of thin air. I read both applications. They do both look very good. <laughs> it's just late. Um, but I'll nominate Caroline uh, Savage. Thank you. Ms. Thank you. Ms. Savage has been moved by Commissioner Dozier, seconded by uh, the junior at-large commissioner. <laughs> Commissioner Cummings, any objections to such? Seeing none, show it as approved. Um, do we have any more items, Mr. Administrator? There are no other items, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. Just a speaker to be heard on non-agenda items. Please. Uh, Erica DeGlopper. Thank you for your patience, ma'am. Name and address for the record, please. I'm nervous and tired. <laughs> um, my name is Erica de Glopper, and <clears throat> I live at 5871 Nightingale Loop. And, um, oh my gosh, got to get some glasses on. Okay. On 3 March 4th, I, my home was served a writ of replevin. And I'm here to talk about that. And it was based on $720,000 of judgments served to my post office box, signed by COVID-19, and served to uh, Jefferson County. I never heard any of that. So on March 4th, my place was raided. <clears throat> I call it raided. You can call it whatever you want. Um, but Leon County on March, um, March 2nd, um, so, uh, the court commissioner saw something, signed it, that they could come into my house. I was never served anything. A $6.8 million archive of the famous USA photographer, Art Shea, was in my home. I've been his archivist since 2005. Okay, um, just to introduce myself, I'm Erica DeGlopper. I was born in Milwaukee. I went to Iowa for a year, Madison, Milwaukee Institute of Design, and then I graduated from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in 2005. I started working for the famous photographer, Art Shea. I fell in love with his work in the year 2000. And um, we put out many books. I fell in love with him with this book. He's a great friend of Nelson Algren, the guy who wrote about, he won the first National Book Award. Um, we put out this book in 2007 on Nelson Algren, this book in 2015 on his wife, and in 2020 we put out this book with University of Chicago Press called Troublemakers, Chicago Freedom Struggles Through the Lens of Art Shea. And <clears throat> I, moved to Kenosha, I moved to Tallahassee because it is beautiful, and I wanted to be near the Black News Channel and Florida A&M to try to integrate this archive with them. And on um, January 28th, 2018, um, Art Shea, four months before he died, notarized, notarized me to be the archivist of his collection. And through eight months of Zoom court hearings in Lake County, very errant orders were ordered for me to ship this $6 million archive across the country without documentation. I said, well, you serve me. They served me nothing. They served my P.O. Box, 38 Tram Road in Mustissa, filed the judgments in Jefferson County, and I'm here to speak to you in Leon County. And if you could just please give me an extra minute. Um, I'm here to speak to you because um, I had a $300,000 deal ready for the Art Shea's work in, um, at the end of January. Uh, January 1st, 2020, it took nine months to work through the Green Bay Packers Committee. On the day it was to actually um, break with Green Bay, my business partner who came and raided my place with Leon County's help, um, 
called 911 on me. I had eight months of court hearings in Lake County. I thought it was horrible when I came to Lake Leon County. It was actually, I didn't get served anything. And um, the service attempts to my home were, um, they called the, uh, the, uh, the um, this is from Leon County. They called the adversarial attorney, that was service attempt one. They clipped open the lock of my, my um, neighbor's shipping container. That was service number two. And service number three was private investigator approached me at Lindy's Chicken. So on March 4th, they raided my place. They took, and why I come to you now in Lake County, just to, to try to wrap it up, um, is they, um, in Leon County, you have to take a much closer look at your standing, standard operating procedures for writ of replevin. For, for them to be there for three hours and take this multi-million dollar archive with no documentation is outrageous. They said a hundred plus boxes. That's what Leon County wrote as far as documentation. I have no idea where it is. There was nothing. It just left. I came home. I was outraged. So, Rittery Plevins, Rittery Plevins have to, you have to have standard operating procedures in place. So when something is taken from a home, there's documentation of what is taken. Okay. And then they're also service. You can't serve a P.O. box. You can't. Okay. Okay. And then just please, I've been here for four and a half hours. I I understand, but could you wrap up, please? I can. I can. I will. And I asked Leon County's help on March 4th. You can look up my name on YouTube. I asked for your help in retrieving these 2,000 files I made of James Meredith, Martin Luther King, um, John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, um, James Lawson, who invented the Freedom Riders. I could not believe that you guys do not already own a Booker T. Washington Rosenwald School, it's in your community. I mean, it's astonishing to me, but thank you so much for moving that forward. I didn't even realize, I'm a huge Booker T. Washington fan, that's why I came here. Please, look at your procedures. I was, Arch Shay's notarized wishes were raped by Leon County and your errant processes in handling writs and services. And it's very, gravely detrimental to black history and I just praise you so much for we're, you know trying to to save fair market value for a Rosenwald school I mean it's priceless it's priceless thank you so much and I I came down here I met with Darius at the Mickey and Black Archives he is totally interested in this archive but this litigation it's going to scare them away. You guys could, in Tallahassee, could own the most amazing black archive history that there is. But you need to help me and work on your standard operating procedures. And I thank you so much for letting me go up beyond my time. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. All right. Madam Attorney, any, 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 anything? So, Replevin is the process by which seized goods are restored to their proper owner. It Mm -hmm. sounds to me like this is a private dispute between Mr. Clapper, I hope I didn't mispronounce her name, and some other private party. Okay. To my knowledge, Leon County proper has had no involvement in this matter. Thank you. Absolutely false. Ma'am, I... I trust my, my county attorney. I, I, I would just say, if, it, if it's a private matter, I'm not sure we can jump in front of it um, and be be of any help. Um, but if, if if there's anything that that you find out that this is not private in nature that we can do, I, I can't I can't take any more comment. You can send me an email. You can give the us a errand, phone call. I know the errand services. I mean, you got to document what you take from people's homes. Ma'am, please, thank you. Please. I appreciate it, but. That documentation wouldn't be on us, would it, Madam Attorney? Absolutely. To my knowledge, Leon County had nothing to do with the seizure of any property at Mr. Clapper's residence. Thank you. Thank you. So you might want to have a conversation. Ma'am, ma'am, thank you. You, you, can, you can hand it over, but you might have a conversation with the with the sheriff's department, maybe the uh, go downstairs. Ma'am, 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 just hear me a second. Hear me out. 
maybe with the sheriff's department, go down to go downstairs, talk to the uh, clerk of court and kind of understand a little more about where it comes from. But we don't even have people on our staff that would that would do what that what, what was done to you. I mean, so Officer um, Ash did it. I understand. But Officer Ash is a, a member of the sheriff's department. So so I would direct those questions there. They are there. OK, thank you. All right. Um, and thank you for 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 a comment today and put it on record. Thank you. Any other speakers? Uh, no, we have no further speakers. Thank you. Um, we'll go now to commissioner to commissioner and staff discussion. Madam Attorney, I dare you to have anything. I have nothing, Vice Chair. Thank you, Vince. I have nothing, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you. you. I appreciate it. Commissioner Miner. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I think we uh, just lost Brent Bell, who was here for uh, most of the meeting, but uh, just wanted to welcome him back. Uh, it's really good to see him. I'm not going to get the details, but uh, really uh, great to see him back and, and at work. And then the second thing, uh, I've been invited to participate as a panelist at the um, AWS Summit in Washington, D.C. from May 23rd to the 25th. There will be about 8,000 uh, technical and non-technical attendees, primarily from the public sector. Leon County is, is, is working very closely with AWS on its certification program uh, for the community here. So I'd like to request, uh, uh, there's no cost for me to attend the summit, but I'd like to request flight and lodging expenses uh, be permitted to come from my office account. Any objection? Seeing none, motion made by Commissioner Minor, seconded by Commissioner Do Dozier, accepted with no objection. Commissioner Minor, you have the floor. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Minor. I'm sorry. Whew. Commissioner Dozier. I was looking at him. Sorry. Commissioner Dozier. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Vice Chair. Um, it is very late, and we could probably discuss this issue a good bit, but I'm going to make it really short. Thank you. Um, in advance of next week's special session, um, encouraged by the governor's veto of the congressional um, district, the maps for congressional districts this year, mm -hmm. um, I would like to ask two things. Yeah. One, the board waive our policy so that we may consider adopting a resolution this evening. Um, it's my understanding from the county attorney that to waive the policy would take a unanimous vote. I'm just seeing this up here. Is there any Chairman. objection to waiving the board's policy to accept a resolution tonight? Any objection? Seeing none, motion well, we made by Commissioner Dozier, seconded by Commissioner Minor with no objection. Okay. There we go. Thank you. So the motion would be to have st staff draft a resolution and for the record, just a few bullets, um, these congressional districts, are, and particularly Congressional District 5, was affirmed by the Florida Supreme Court in 2015. Um, after a special session, they had rejected others, and it's in line with the Fair, Distri um, Fair Districts Amendment. Boy, it is late. I had this down a few hours ago. Um, we have probably all been tracking this news a good bit, but I think for our purposes, um, the Florida House and Senate passed maps that preserve this district. Um, this is a bipartisan, basically supported map at this point, and the courts have affirmed it. Um, I don't think any of us want to see um, the voters of Leon County impacted, their representation reduced, and particularly the important minority representation that District 5 provides for the state. So with that, I have discussed this with staff. Mr. County Administrator, you said you all could pull some of this information and the information from our legislative updates to draft that resolution um, in advance of the special session. All right, motion to be made by Commissioner Dozier for a resolution as she has described. Thank you. Written by staff that will be approved tonight. That motion to be made is there a second to that motion. Motion is seconded by Commissioner Cummings. Any objection to that motion? Seeing no objection, show it as Thank approved you. unanimously. Commissioner Dozier, you have the floor. Um, the only other thing I've already did my little happy dance for, for the uh, new project at Innovation Park. Um, look forward to a groundbreaking in May. But I am also looking forward to um, the Regional Planning Council's Hemp Summit. Mm -hmm. This is an industrial hemp summit focused on a new economic <coughs> opportunity for our region. It will be April 26th through 28th. We've got some national speakers coming in, so if anyone's interested, registration is still open, and you can find the 850 Hemp Summit. This is for any entrepreneurs, any researchers, anyone interested in a new economic development opportunity 
Um, it's a great job for the region. Thank you. Thank that you. The administrator has said if we go past 11 that we have to make a motion to extend. I don't plan to go past 11. Commissioner Dozier, I want to let you know I appreciate the work you did, you've done over the 12 years at Innovation Park. I was very envious when you got the appointment over me when we first got on this board. But you have served us well on that board, and I really appreciate the work that you've done and the leadership that you provide. So thank you. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair. I uh, just wanted to real quickly thank the county attorney for helping us finally land the plane, so to speak, on the uh, Man of War and Pimlico Parks uh, um, acquisition from Killarn Acres. Those parks are going to be now brought into the county inventory and maintained at the most excellent, highest county standards. And uh, the county attorney's office worked really diligently on that acquisition, and I just wanted to give her a big public shout-out because I think she's great. Dan Rigo. Dan I'll Rigo. Shout out further to Dan Rigo. For Dan Rigo, who works, I assume, for the incredible county attorney of, yeah. of, of Leon County. So thank you, Dan, and, and thank you, all your staff, Chastity. Thank you, Commissioner Madden. Welch. Uh, congratulations to our county attorney staff. Um, Commissioner Cummings. Nothing. Look at you. Principal. Thank you, sir. Um, I intentionally stayed quiet during the. Um, Transmittal hearing, so I could at least uh, mention two important items to me. The first one is, um, Mr. Administrator, I, I would hope that I could ask for an agenda item to uh, come back to us regarding uh, Lake Talquin and uh, drawdown efforts. That hasn't been done since 1992. It's a way that the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, Game and Fish Commission, and our local county um, can uh, improve the banks along Lake Talquin shorelines. Right. Isn't that right, uh, Commissioner uh, Proctor? Yes, sir. I told him I'd take him fishing, but I have to blindfold him so he couldn't mark the spot. Uh, most been made by by uh, Commissioner Jackson for agenda item. Is there a second? Second. Most has been second. Is there any objection? So it is approved, Commissioner Jackson. And secondly, um, I didn't want the moment to slip, Commissioner Minor. Uh, Brent just came back in from his two-mile nightly run. Brent Pills, good to see your face back in the, the uh, crowds. Good to see you here. Appreciate your work. Brent, welcome back, my man. That's it? And that's all I got? Commissioner Proud, you got 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're a good man. You hadn't been able to say anything in 10 minutes, but you got 10 minutes. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to just say that the Lantry Hollinger is out there, and he's given to us the Leon County Division of Florida Civil Rights Museum. That's right. So in the interest of him not getting up, I'm asking can we uh, adopt this uh, as a uh, uh, agenda item for a future meeting and that we can give. All right, agenda discussion. item for, to, for us to look at the Leon County Division of the Florida Civil Rights Museum, that agenda item will come back uh, at, a, at a later date. Thank you, Mr. Hollinger, for this information. Is there a second? I will second that. Any objection? Carries without objection. Thank you, Sherman. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, yes, yes. We are adjourned. Thank you so much for your patience.